This video is about two things. The first is SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy, a horrific monster who murders anyone and anything unfortunate enough to look at its face, directly or through photos or videos. The second is you, because we asked you for your favorite questions, theories, and hypothetical situations involving 096. We even asked if you thought someone would be safe from 096 on the moon, and you delivered. If you haven't watched our first video on the infamous Shy Guy, we recommend checking that out first, but feel free to stick around even if you haven't. First of all, let's take a look at the questions you had about the SCP Foundation's most dangerous introvert and see if we can't find some answers. How close would you have to be to trigger it? Like, if it was 5 kilometers away, would it still count? The short answer is that 096's homicidal rage can be triggered from pretty much any distance. We'll get into some of the potentially crazy extents of this later on, but if you see the shy guy's face while you're sharing a dimension with him, you're in serious trouble. People who viewed the creature's face in different countries or even miles underwater have met gruesome ends. Five kilometers would definitely not keep you safe. What were his origins and how strong is he compared to SCP-682? The origins of SCP-096 are still shrouded in mystery. All we know for sure is that he was discovered by the Foundation in a snowy mountainous region. As for physical durability, he's about even with 682 as both survived their encounter. We know 682 has the psychological advantage though, as 096 has been terrified of the lizard ever since they met in cross-testing. However, you could argue that 096 is technically more dangerous, since unlike 682, 096 has never been pacified before killing its intended target while on a rampage. If he goes into an unstoppable attack mode when someone sees his face, shouldn't you not show his face in the thumbnail? Thankfully, according to the official documents, artistic representations like paintings or digitally drawn YouTube thumbnails have no effect. Only actual photographs or videos of the creature can be deadly, so you're safe. Unless we decide to do a 096 face reveal to celebrate our next 100,000 subscribers, of course. This leads us to our next question. If it attacks you when you look at it, then how did the scientist draw the picture of the thing without looking at it? That's a good question, and also one that occurred to the Foundation scientists who came up with an extremely elaborate solution. They put a D-Class tattoo artist inside a diving bell miles underwater and had him unseal a photograph of the creature before drawing a copy. This copy was then released from the diving bell in a sealed container before 096 inevitably got to the poor D-Class. Does the shy guy have to be viewed through a good quality image to enter a rage state? Unfortunately, no. Even the most poorly rendered or minuscule image of 096's face is a death sentence. One of the most infamous incidents resulted from a man seeing a small dot that was only a few pixels wide in a photo from an old ski trip. The dot was 096, taken from a mile away. No true image of 096 is safe, regardless of size. In some canons, despite 096 being referred to as indestructible, the Foundation managed to terminate it after many attempts and even more bureaucracy. How did they do it? While a lot of 096's body has been blown away by conventional arms fire, its hyper-tough skeleton is what has given it such an indestructible reputation. In one tale, though, Foundation researchers actually used this to their advantage and employed the use of the neck-snapping killer sculpture SCP-173. After using 173 to damage 096's bones, powerful acid was injected into the skeleton, destroying it from within. Though, of course, this isn't the official ending of the 096 story, because the SCP Foundation doesn't have a single unifying canon. That's enough questions. Now it's time for you to school us. Let's look at some of your favorite theories about the Shy Guy, starting with... I sometimes like to imagine that 096 is nice, but he can't control when someone sees him and after he kills the person he starts to cry because he didn't want to kill them. There is actually some evidence to suggest that SCP-096 might not want to kill. A great example of this is its cross-test with SCP-978, a camera which reveals the deepest desires of whoever or whatever is in its photos. The photo it took of 096 showed that it had completely disappeared from the photo, showing its deepest desire was to just be invisible and unseen. 
Maybe it wants to disappear because it doesn't want to hurt anybody. Regarding the moon question, I think SCP-096 would probably stay in that hostile state until you came back, at which point it would promptly rip you to shreds and do whatever it does to your mutilated corpse. Based on what we know about prior 096 incidents, this feels incredibly likely. It's also possible that it might enter its docile state before becoming aggressive again when you return to its murder range. You really don't want to find out either way. He can just jump to the moon easy. He does squats and containment all the time. While its scrawny physique doesn't make it seem like 096 understands the concept of exercise, there aren't any cameras in 096's cell, so technically we can't prove it isn't doing squats to pass the time in there. I really doubt a blind person would be safe from his effect, since 096 has the IQ of a newborn baby. I think he will count it as looking at him. This is an interesting theory. However, seeing as 096 is able to sense when people see its face from entire continents away, the way it knows if you can see its face might be a little more psychic in nature. Therefore, it's probable that it wouldn't mistakenly kill someone who hasn't actually seen its face, such as a person who is blind. To deal with him, in my opinion, simply freeze him, either in space or in the mountains. His body shuts down and when looked at it, it will not react correctly. It is simply asleep. While we don't know how SCP-096 would react to a zero-G environment, for a creature that's always nude, it seems extremely tolerant to the cold. When it was first found, it was lurking in icy mountains, and a Foundation agent commented on the fact it wasn't even shivering, despite the incredibly low temperatures. But who knows if there's a temperature out there that's too low even for the shy guy. If someone looks at it in China and it's in the US, then you get on its back, you'll get a free piggyback ride to China. It's a free trip to China and all it costs is a human life. That's my theory. Technically, it'd be at the cost of two human lives. Unless you wore a diving suit with plenty of oxygen. 096 has proven to be an extremely proficient swimmer, but you'd have to maintain your grip across the entire Pacific Ocean while it journeys to China. In other words, it's technically possible. But we here at SCP Explained would rather pay for the round-trip flight. To each their own, though. But that's enough theories for now. Let's move on to the main event. Hypotheticals. You pose some great possible scenarios involving SCP-096, so we're going to see if we can find the answers. What would happen if someone looked at a picture of it while in or before entering another SCP's pocket dimension or mirror dimension? There aren't any canon examples to prove either way, but if there's any kind of consistent entry point into this dimension, it's likely that 096 would find a way to follow you in. If not, it's very possible that it may just wait for you to eventually return before bringing the metaphorical hammer down on you. So technically, if you were pulled into the old man's pocket dimension and he closed the portal, you'd be safe from 096. But then you've got a whole other problem to deal with. What happens if a person sees his face then gets their memory of the creature wiped? Considering how good the Foundation seems to be at wiping people's memories and their access to amnestics, if this worked, they probably would have made it standard procedure by now, so it's unlikely. What happens if a person looked at it and that person then went on a plane? Or just staying in the air or space, what would it do? 096 has shown the ability to jump up and destroy low-flying aircraft. But otherwise, it's likely that the creature would probably run to a point directly below you and remain there until you touch back down. Since you'll need food and water at some point and aircrafts need fuel, you'd probably just be prolonging the inevitable. What if the young girl was around it so it tried to attack her but died trying? This is another interesting possibility. SCP-053 is a girl capable of causing homicidal urges but causes fatal heart attacks in those who attack her. While we can't know for sure how a meeting between 096 and 053 would go, we can use her encounter with 682 as a potential template. Aggressive SCPs like the hard-to-kill reptile, perhaps having an innate knowledge of the danger that comes from attacking 053, tend to become strangely docile around her. It's possible that 096 would do the same. Would we be able to control SCP-096 with the help of SCP-035? The Possessive Mask, aka SCP-035, is undeniably a lot more intelligent than 096, and has even been shown to respond to reason on occasion. It's also been able to control almost every other entity it's been placed on. The problem is, 
If the mask was placed on 096 and it was somehow effective, the result may be even more dangerous than 096, an intelligent monster with an indestructible and highly dangerous body. There's no telling whether 035 would slowly break down 096 into sludge the way it does to humans, in which case we would be left with an immortal 096-035 combo. So maybe it's best that we never find out. If someone were to be in the infinite Ikea and looked at a picture of its face, could it finally be contained? And if someone else looked at a picture of it outside of the infinite Ikea, could it escape and kill them? If so, how long would it take it? This is a great question. And while the infinite Ikea is a terrifying maze, SCP-096 has an advantage here that we don't. Not only can it rip through anything in the way with its super strength, it has an innate sense of where its victim is. Therefore, regardless of whether you're inside or out, SCP-096 will still come straight to you to exact your horrible fate. But at least you can enjoy the meatballs while you wait, right? And finally, what would happen if 096 were led into a room full of mirrors and allowed or made to look at its own face? Would it smash the mirrors or try to rip itself to pieces? This is still a hotly debated issue to this day which, thanks to the no-canon nature of the SCP Foundation, does not have a definitive answer. Some theorize that this would at least be an effective deterrent against SCP-096, while others suggest that it wouldn't be effective, because many believe that 096 is actually blind and thus cannot see its own face. It can only sense when other people see it. Again, we don't quite know for sure but it's likely to remain one of the most contentious issues around the Shy Guy for a long time to come. It's the late 90s, and an Air Canada flight experiences severe malfunctions while traveling from London to Vancouver. The pilots are unable to do anything and the plane crashes into the woods of northern Alberta. The crash was devastating. Only 10 of the nearly 300 people on board are alive. And even though they survived the initial disaster, their battle for life has only just begun. It's late autumn in northern Canada, and there's no telling when help will arrive, if at all. If the survivors want to make it through the night, they need to find shelter, and fast. As they trudge through the freezing woods, the group finds a path that looks like it might lead them to civilization. After all, if there was a path in the woods, that meant they were probably in a national park. And if they were in a national park, there had to be a ranger station around somewhere where they could warm up and call for help. They didn't have many other options, so they followed the path which opened up to a clearing. But instead of finding a ranger station or campground, they found something none of them could have expected. It was a pond, but there was something off about it. As they got closer, they saw that this strange pond wasn't filled with water, but blood. The survivors were horrified. That couldn't really be blood, could it? It must have been a weird algae or chemical reaction. But one member of the group, a man named Thomas Dean, who had been on his way back to his hometown of Prince George, British Columbia, thought there was something strangely familiar about this. He remembered being a boy and going to visit family in Alberta, and hearing an urban legend from the older local kids. According to the stories, somewhere out in the wilderness, in the northern part of the province, there was a pond full of human blood. And what made it even worse was that some said the pond was a gateway to hell. The SCP Foundation was also aware of this legend, and had been trying to pinpoint the exact source of it for decades prior to the Air Canada crash. They would finally receive definite confirmation of the blood pond when Foundation personnel intercepted a radio transmission from a ranger station located within the Wood Buffalo National Park. It was the survivors of the crash who had managed to make it through the night, and they were about to be escorted out of the park by rangers. The Foundation mobilized quickly to cordon off the pond, as at the time they were unsure of what potentially harmful properties the pond might have had. They set up Watch Station Epsilon 38 and put staff on guard to deter travelers from the area. The pond was given the designation of SCP-354 and classed as Euclid. Foundation scientists made a number of interesting discoveries about SCP-354 when they collected samples for testing. First, the pond was not in fact full of blood, merely an inorganic liquid that closely resembles blood in color and consistency. Second, and even stranger than the red liquid, is that the pond doesn't seem to have any definite banks or a bottom, 
Instead, the liquid in the pond increases in density as the radius away from the center increases. The liquid congeals at the edges, becoming more solid and blending into the surrounding soil. It also becomes thicker as one descends deeper into the pool, and a bottom of the pond has not yet been reached, if it even exists. Initially, the Foundation found no signs of life within the blood pond, but that would all change at 2.03 p.m. on the day following the opening of Watch Station Epsilon 38. When the science team noticed an unusual level of activity on the pond's surface, security footage feed showed a shape rising out of the pond, followed by a deafening shriek. After that, the feed was cut and Foundation lost all communication with Watch Station Epsilon 38. Fearing the worst, a mobile task force was dispatched to the location. When they got there, all personnel at the Watch Station had been killed by what could only be described as a gigantic bat. The task force was able to neutralize the entity, and as soon as they could, the Foundation moved in to increase security around the SCP, creating Area 354 and installing a permanent security detail. After this point, the pond started to regularly spit out a variety of monstrous entities, almost as if it was reacting to the SCP Foundation's increased security measures. After SCP-354-1, the giant bat, came SCP-354-2. 354-2 was an echidna-like monster the size of a bear that was virtually bulletproof but unable to escape Area 354. The Foundation neutralized this anomaly with napalm. SCP-354-3 was a floating black sphere capable of firing deadly beams of concentrated energy. The area's head scientist was able to hit it with a sledgehammer, causing the sphere to malfunction and self-destruct before it was able to escape the area. The Foundation wasn't as lucky with SCP-354-4. This creature was a reptilian humanoid that stood roughly 15 feet tall and was unable to be put down with gunfire. This was the first creature from the pond to successfully escape containment, and was only able to be neutralized when the Foundation sent in Mobile Task Force Omega-7, also known as Pandora's Box. The data on pond incursions is partially corrupted, so a complete list of creatures is not available. But some of the other monsters that came out of the blood pond include a killer robot, a set of gigantic tentacles that drag several D-Class personnel into the pond, a pair of panther-like creatures, one made of ice and the other of magma, that ignored Foundation staff and instead fought each other, and one seemingly normal human man who was executed as soon as he emerged from the pond. Tests on his body revealed that he was, in fact, totally normal and would have posed no threat. These anomalies came out of the pond at fairly regular intervals for several months before the pond went silent for an unprecedented 22 months. The head scientist at the time noted, I suspect this means one of two things. Either the red pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is, or is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. His words would prove eerily prophetic following the events of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. The Foundation's research and development team built a specialized craft to explore the pond. Because of the strange properties of the pond's density, the craft was essentially made to be both a submarine for parts of the pond where the contents were liquid and a drill for when the liquid congealed into a semi-solid towards the bottom. The exploration team consisted of Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, Leroy Tucker, and a pilot named Martin. With the team assembled, the ship was sent down into the pond. Nothing eventful happened for the first two days of the mission, but at 4.30 a.m. on the third day, gravity suddenly reversed for the crew of the ship. This seemed to indicate that they were approaching the halfway point, though what would be on the other side, nobody could say. On the fourth day, the ship surfaced, proving definitely that the pond was in fact some sort of portal. The crew looked out of the portholes to see the darkness of night above them. While sensors outside the ship detected nothing harmful in the atmosphere around them, the crew were wary of exiting the craft. The other side of the pond was nothing like the world the crew knew. For one thing, the night lasted for 28 hours before dawn came, and when the sun finally rose, it was much larger and redder than the Earth's sun. Under the light of the strange red star, the crew could see that the pond on this side was massive compared to what they've come into, more like a large lake. 
Surrounding the lake was sand and rocks that were covered in a kind of moss that disappeared under sunlight and regrew during the night. The team left the ship and started to explore. During their time in this strange world, they found that the day lasted just a few hours shorter than the night, meaning that whatever planet they were on had a roughly 43-hour long rotation as opposed to our own planet's 24. The team found a number of anomalous elements on their expedition, including razor-sharp grass that can puncture skin and streams of liquid carbon dioxide. They heard some loud roars in the distance once or twice, but other than that, the planet was eerily silent, with seemingly no animal life and not even wind. When it rained, the soil remained dry, and based on that, the scientists theorized the plants in this world were more efficient at absorbing moisture. On the 25th day, the team ran into a huge metal wall that appeared to be artificially constructed. Luckily, Leroy Tucker, a quick-thinking researcher, was able to rig a blowtorch from camping supplies and melt a hole through the metal. On the other side, there was finally wind and odd black grass. That's the extent of what is known about the other side of the wall, because the expedition logs are heavily corrupted after that point. But we know that whatever was in there wasn't good, because the team never returned. Strangely, there's no record of any names mentioned in the ship's log, almost as if being killed on the other side completely erased them from history. No other expeditions into the pond were launched after that. On an undisclosed date, a year following the discovery of the Blood Pond and construction of Area 354, the site was completely evacuated, and power was cut to the area. Mobile Task Force Data 12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation, but before contact could be established, the area's on-site nuclear warhead was detonated, completely destroying the site. MTF Theta-12 was then attacked by a convoy made up of D-Class and other low-ranking staff who had evacuated Area 354. It was apparent that there had been some kind of mutiny within the site, and that a dissolution of the chain of command had led to its evacuation and destruction. The convoy totally annihilated MTF Theta-12, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Following the site's detonation, a new site was constructed called simply the Red Pool Containment Site. Unlike the previous facility, which focused on research and neutralization, the new site is entirely concerned with containment. The shift in directive came as a response to the pond's apparent reactive nature. Each creature that emerged from the pond seemed to be in retaliation to the Foundation's actions, and it was theorized by some that the mutiny at Area 354 was triggered by some kind of psychic attack from the pond itself. An interview in the SCP file on 354 reveals that there was one more disastrous attempt to control and understand the blood pond. According to an interview with a Foundation agent, the head doctor proposed a scheme to drain the blood pond using a system of pumps and hoses. All non-essential personnel were evacuated in case of emergency, leaving only the pump technicians, D-Class personnel, and a few agents for security. However, as soon as the pump was scheduled to be turned on, everyone at the site experienced a mass dissociative episode. The agent described the feeling they all experienced as like being in a dream and suddenly realizing that you're asleep. He said, Everything stopped being real. It was like we had to escape right now. When asked what happened when the pump was turned on, he simply explained that it wouldn't let them. This interview confirmed the theory that the pond is not only capable of releasing monsters out into our world, but also that it's capable of powerful but much more subtle psychological attacks. This suggests a chilling possibility, that the pond isn't just blindly reacting to being attacked, but it's fully sentient, and the actions of the SCP Foundation have only served to annoy it. And worst, studies of the pond's banks have proved evidence that the area of congealed liquid around the perimeter of the pond has been steadily expanding. That's right, the pond is getting bigger. The last thing the Foundation agent stationed at the site said before being dragged out of the interview and sedated was, It gets bigger and stronger every day, and now we've made it angry. A bright flash of light awakens Pietro Wilson from his vegetative state. He sits up and brushes the sand off himself looking around the desolate desert he's found himself in. How did he get here? The last thing he remembers is uncovering secret orders from the leaders of the SCP Foundation, just before they declared war on humanity. Unfortunately, the most important parts of the files had been redacted. Now he's on a mission to finally discover why the SCP Foundation is trying to kill every last human on the planet, but there is something else he has to deal with first. What happened? Pietro says out loud as he looks at his vitals in the heads-up display of SCP-5000. He is still contained within the exclusionary suit that makes him undetectable to human senses. 
He checks the date and gasps in surprise. Three months? I've been passed out for three months? He stands up and looks across the barren landscape. The screen inside the suit indicates that he has traversed half of the country since he left Site-19 three months ago. Pietro looked down at one of his hands. He is holding a leather briefcase. Where did that come from? He wonders. Pietro has no idea what is inside the briefcase, but he knows it definitely isn't round. He tries to let go. His fingers won't open. He uses his other hand to try and pry the briefcase away from himself, but his hand only clasps to it harder. Then a wave of calm washes over him. Something inside his head speaks to him, but it's not a voice, more like a feeling. It is a sense of purpose, and Pietro's new mission in life is to deliver this briefcase to SCP-579. Nothing else is as important. Pietro Wilson takes a deep breath and embraces his new purpose in life. He still wants to uncover the reason that the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity, but this will have to wait until he delivers the briefcase to SCP-579. Pietro doesn't know exactly where 579 is located, but he can feel a pull in a certain direction, so he begins to walk. Pietro brings up the information stored in the SCP-5000 suit from the Foundation's database. He finds that all information about what SCP-579 is has been expunged from the record. The only useful information in the file is that the Keter-level SCP is located at Site-62C. At least Pietro has a destination to aim for. He travels for days without seeing a living soul, but he does pass thousands of corpses. He tries to ignore them, but one stands out to him inside a house as he searches for supplies. It's the body of a recently deceased boy. He couldn't have been more than eight years old. He was so young, Pietro thinks. He bends over to scoop up the body and bury it outside. As his hand touches the body, the boy's skin begins to move. It is as if hundreds of tiny creatures are scurrying just under the skin. Then from out of every orifice comes hundreds of little pale worms, each with the face of the boy. They are all cackling as they crawl out of the boy's body and into a drain a few feet away. Pietro jumps back and runs. This is the last person I try to bury, he thinks. Pietro pushes forward, the hundreds of little laughing worms haunting his thoughts, until he puts a significant distance between himself and the little boy's body. Pietro continues to walk towards the direction of Site 62C. He passes more corpses, but decides to stay clear of them. Although the suit makes it so Pietro doesn't need to rest, he can only go so fast. He enters a small, abandoned town that looks like something out of an old western movie. A tumbleweed blows across the dirt road. Pietro sits on the wooden step of the local saloon and takes a break. He looks down at the briefcase in his hand. He hasn't had the urge to open it, only to deliver it to SCP-579. Pietro puts the briefcase on his lap. He stares at it and slides his hands along the leather, stops with his thumb on the latch, and pushes. The locks snap open. Pietro opens the briefcase. A bright light beams out, and he passes out. When Pietro comes to again, he is miles closer to Site 62C. There is a warm feeling enveloping his body. He looks down at the briefcase, which is now closed. Wow, this thing is like my own personal skip button, Pietro thinks. He holds up the briefcase, unlatches the locks, sees the bright light, and passes out again. He awakes once again miles away from his last position. So it wasn't just a one-off effect. Pietro continues walking across the country, switching between using his own legs and whatever magic is contained within the briefcase. He is making faster progress now. As he walks through a dense, deciduous forest, he comes across a pack of wolves eating the remains of an SCP agent. Pietro is undetectable to the wolves thanks to the SCP-5000 suit and he makes his way over to the pack, quietly grabbing a laptop laying on the ground next to the agent's body. Pietro takes the laptop and goes away deeper into the forest before stopping to boot up the computer. He has not forgotten about the horrors the SCP Foundation has released, and he needs to know how the world has been doing over the last few months. What he finds is not good. The SCP Foundation has triggered the eruption of Yellowstone, destroying SCP-2000 which, unknown to Pietro, contained the failsafe for rebuilding human society in the event of a world-ending scenario, which this was starting to look more and more like. 
It was only a matter of time now before the soot and ash thrown up by the eruption blocks out the sun in much of what is left of the United States. The Foundation has also found a way to get SCP-2241 to do their dirty work at refugee camps. The young brown-haired boy is most likely being manipulated by the Foundation under the pretense that they are only doing what is best for their child. He has caused whole groups of refugees to turn on each other, leading to a massacre. The last entry says that the young boy is being sent to the Global Occult Coalition holdout in Genzir to help destroy some of the last threats to the SCP Foundation. A series of other SCPs have been dispatched by the Foundation around the world to continue the destruction of humanity. They even managed to use temporal anomalies to make it Christmas time everywhere around the world. So SCP-4666, the brutal Yuletide creature that stalks the homes of children, is free to cause chaos. Pietro had seen enough. He slams the laptop shut, throws it against the trunk of a tree, and opens the briefcase again. He awakes, standing feet away from a group of Global Occult Coalition soldiers who are sitting around a campfire. Maybe they know why the SCP Foundation is trying to end the world, he thinks. He decides that it is too risky to show himself to the soldiers, but takes some solace in sitting around the campfire with other living humans. The soldiers are sharing stories about what is happening. One catches the attention of Pietro Wilson. It is strange, but also may hold a clue as to why the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity. One of the soldiers recounts an event that he witnessed before leaving the Global Occult Coalition's headquarters at Genzir. They had just captured an SCP soldier trying to break into the base. The infiltrator's name was Samuel Ross. He had been strapped into an interrogation chair and questioned. The interviewers were not getting anywhere until Ross was threatened with torture. To which he responded, Do what you want. Once you realize you're not supposed to feel pain, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Pietro sits up straight and starts to listen more intently. He remembers stumbling across SCP soldiers on his way to Site-19 that exhibited the same no-pain mentality that this Samuel Ross seems to have. After that odd statement by Samuel Ross, there was the sound of wind. It started slow at first, then ramped up until it was howling like a hurricane. That's when the screaming started. The screams became louder and climbed to a higher pitch. Then the room went dead silent. The last thing that Samuel Ross said was, Look what you've done to yourselves. I told you you wouldn't like it, didn't you? That's why you hear your voice. But you wanted to know so badly. I really liked you guys, so I was trying to be nice. We're so kind to you, you know. We fight in the light, so you can die in the dark. Hmm, <laughs> disgusting. Pietro sits back on his haunches and rocks back and forth. He has an ominous feeling that there is a connection between the missing pain of the SCP soldiers and the reason why the Foundation declared war on humanity. The soldier who told the story of Samuel Ross stands up. After that interview is when the destruction of Genzir started from the inside. It is why the Global Occult Coalition is no more. God help us all. The soldier finished with his story, turns from the others and starts to walk away. As the soldier makes his way towards the woods, Pietro can just barely make out that he's taken his pistol from his holster before he disappears into the darkness. The world truly has gone mad. Pietro opens the briefcase and blacks out. Pietro sluggishly continues his walk. He's moving down a rocky path in the middle of the forest, and his will to keep going is slowly being drained. The only reason he has not sat down and given up is because of the driving urge to get the briefcase to 579. He wants so badly to concentrate and discover the reason that the Foundation released the SCPs on humanity, but the need to reach 579 won't let him focus on anything else. He's noticed, though, that every time he opens the briefcase to skip ahead, he makes less and less progress. The warm feeling of the first few transports has been replaced by a nauseated headache every time he comes out of the trance. Pietro exits the forest into an open field. The wind blows across the high grass looking like green waves, and standing scattered throughout the field are statues. As Pietro approaches, he sees that they are statues of Mobile Task Force Foundation soldiers. He slowly walks closer to the white marble statues. He reaches the first one and looks at the face of the frozen soldier. His eyes have been scooped out. 
All that remains are black, empty sockets. The arms of the soldier have been carved into blades, like a praying mantis. He walks past the first statue and proceeds to the next one, where he hears something move in the grass behind him. He spins around to look at the statue. He could have sworn it was in a slightly different position. No, that's crazy, Pietro thinks. He continues to the next statue. It is another carving of an MTF soldier. No eyes, blades for arms. This is really creepy, Pietro says aloud. He proceeds through the field. He walks up a slight hill and turns around to look at the field of statues. What he sees is terrifying. The statues have all moved and are now in different positions. It appears as if they were slashing through the area looking for something. Or someone. Pietro continues over the hill and comes upon a group of refugees. They are picking through the field looking for food to eat. A fog begins to move in. It is being swept across the meadow by the wind. Pietro watches from a distance as the fog envelops the small group. Suddenly there is screaming and the sound of blades going through flesh. The screams cease almost immediately. Pietro runs down the hill to where the refugees were. The fog lifts. The group of people have been cut to pieces. Standing in the middle of the carnage is one of the MTF soldier statues, blood dripping from its blade arms. Pietro knows what to do. He runs. After a few miles, Pietro slows to catch his breath. Those statues must have been created by the Foundation, he thinks. It's as if they are frozen in place. But as soon as you take your eyes off them, they can move with killer speed. Even in the suit, my eyesight can stop them. But they can't see me. They must know I'm there, though, since they can't move. Pietro Wilson opens the briefcase once again, for what he didn't know would be the last time. When he comes to this time, he is near Site 62C. He can feel himself being pulled stronger than ever in the direction of his destination. He walks down a deserted road past the husks of burnt vehicles, and at the end is the gate to Site 62C. There are no guards or security of any kind. It looks like the site has been abandoned for a long time, and the gate is wide open, beckoning Pietro Wilson into Site 62C, where SCP-579 waits. Pietro Wilson enters the dark hallway he somehow knows leads down into the crypt of Site 62C. The walls drip with what he hopes is water from leaking pipes, but it has a metallic smell, and is much too red to actually be water. He begins to feel nauseous. It gets harder to breathe. Even the SCP-5000 suit can't keep him calm. He turns and runs back up the stairs out of Site 62C. Pietro begins to sob uncontrollably, as the memories of everything that has happened over the past several months suffocates his will to go on. Then, as if an invisible force that refuses to let him go takes control. Pietro feels as if a gun has been shoved into the small of his back. He is being sent back into Site 62C, whether he wants to go or not. He is unsure if what is forcing him back into the base is inside the briefcase, his own uncontrollable urge to know what is going on, or SCP-579 itself, but he cannot stop himself from re-entering the doorway and proceeding into Site 62C. He doesn't know what SCP-579 looks like, but Pietro has a sinister feeling that it is watching him. He reaches the bottom of the stairway and proceeds down a dark hallway. The power went out a long time ago, and the only light in the depths of Site 62C is the dim glow coming from the helmet of the SCP-5000 suit. Pietro notices long gashes along the concrete walls, as if someone took a giant knife and dragged it from one end of the hallway to the other. There is something at the end of the corridor that Pietro can't make out. As he gets closer, the lights on the SCP-5000 suit begin to flicker. The thing at the end of the hallway seems to move slightly each time the lights on the suit dim. The lights on the suit go out completely, and the entire hallway is plunged into darkness. Only for a second though, and when the lights come back on, a statue of an MTF soldier looms over Pietro. Its eyes are empty sockets, its lips are turned up in a snarl, the arms have been filed into blades. No! Pietro screams. He dodges around the statue. The moment it is out of his sight, he hears the sound of blades on concrete. As the statue of the soldier comes to life and begins slashing its way down the hallway, it cannot see Pietro, but it knows he is there. It slashes all around, trying to connect with whoever is there with it. Pietro runs to the end of the hallway and reaches a door. 
He presses against the heavy metal door to open, straining against its weight all while the blind statue is still slashing, coming closer and closer. The door is almost open, but then Pietro feels a blade lacerate the back of the suit, cutting deeply into the skin of his back, missing his spinal cord by millimeters. Another blade enters through the back of his shoulder, piercing straight through. He somehow pulls himself through the cracked doorway and kicks the metal door shut behind him. He can hear the banging and scraping of blades outside the metal door. The creature has not given up and is trying to break in. Pietro turns around to see he is in an observation chamber full of instruments and screens. Blood runs down his back from the wounds inflicted by the statue. He walks slowly over to the window. On the desk in front of him is a file labeled SCP-579. He looks through the observation glass and down into the chamber below. It is too dark to make anything out, but Pietro can feel that SCP-579 is down there looking up at him. Pietro looks to his left and sees a hole in the floor. He walks over and looks down, and leads right into the containment chamber of 579. Let's get this over with, Pietro says out loud. He holds the briefcase over the hole and tries to open his hand. His finger won't budge. SCP-579 wants him to hand deliver the briefcase. Pietro Wilson takes a deep breath, closes his eyes, and steps into the opening of the hole. He falls. In the moments before he lands in SCP-579's containment chamber, something comes to him. He realizes that he isn't going to be a hero. He isn't going to figure out why the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity, and he isn't going to survive. He lands hard on the ground below. It is completely dark, except for a shadow that moves in the corner of the containment chamber. Pietro Wilson creates one last log. If anyone ever reads this, please, please figure out why. Explain it to me. Someone. Anyone. I don't get it. I just don't get it. SCP-579 steps into the glow that the SCP-5000 suit is giving off. Pietro Wilson looks up at it. Oh, so that's how it is. He says before SCP-5000 creates its final log. Life signs, lost. Vital signs, lost. SCP-5000 appeared in a flash of light in the containment chamber of SCP-579, located in Site-62C. The researchers monitoring SCP-579 had no idea where the suit came from, or why it contained the body of Pietro Wilson, a Foundation employee who is assigned to Site-06 and is very much alive. Wilson appears to have no knowledge of SCP-5000, or memories of the events logged in SCP-5000's databanks. Although the suit is believed to have been capable at one point of a number of anomalous functions and abilities, the damage it has sustained has rendered it inoperable, except for the storage of data files, which now have been archived and stored on secure Foundation servers. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A young man was driving home from work late one rainy night when he spotted a woman in a white dress and a red sweater walking along the shoulder of the road. Concerned for her safety, he slowed down and rolled down the window so he could talk to her. When he asked where she was going, she said she was walking to her parents' house. The man pulled over and offered her a ride that she accepted. The woman gave him the address of her home, hopped in the back seat, and the man drove off. He sensed that she must have been cold from walking in the rain, so he cranked up the car's heater to help her dry off. Soon, she removed her heavy red sweater and placed it on the seat next to her. The man tried to make friendly conversation, asking if the woman had a job, what she was studying at school, where she'd been that day. But she remained quiet, staring out the window, until they drove past an old graveyard. The woman began pounding on the glass of the car as if she desperately wanted something. Unsure of what to do, the man pulled over, but before he could ask her what was happening, she had gotten out of the car. He exited the car to try and find her, but the woman was nowhere to be seen. She must have somehow ran off. Confused, the man got back in his car and drove away. He went on his way and didn't think of it again until the next day, when he noticed her sweater was still in the back of his car. He decided to go to the house she had originally given him the address for and give it back to her. He found the home without any trouble, but when he knocked on the door, the old woman who answered it was confused by his story. She told him that her daughter couldn't have possibly left her sweater in his car, 
because she died in a car accident 30 years ago. The Vanishing Hitchhiker is a classic ghost story, with the details varying from place to place and storyteller to storyteller. In Chicago, she goes by Resurrection Mary, named after the graveyard she asks for rides to. In Okinawa, Japan, she's known as the Nightwalker of Nago, and she only appears to taxi drivers. In Kent, England, she's Suzanne, a bride killed in a car wreck on the way to her bachelorette party. In North Carolina, her name is Lydia, and in Hawaii, she's believed to be the goddess Pele in human form. But as far as our friends at the SCP Foundation are concerned, the vanishing hitchhiker's name is Mary Talish, also known as SCP-1337. On the 19th of May, 1952, college sophomore Mary Talish was abducted on her way to class in her hometown of Muncie, Indiana. When police found her body two weeks later, her eyes and heart had been torn from her body in a ritualistic fashion, and she had scrapes and bruises that suggested she had been beaten before her murder. Her killers were never caught, and her body was returned to her family for burial in Tomlinson Cemetery. Starting on the 19th of June that same year, someone matching Mary's description, a Caucasian woman with blonde hair standing 150 centimeters tall and wearing a red sweater, was spotted trying to fly down passing vehicles along Mayflower Road. Since then, every month on the 19th, Mary has been sighted along that stretch of road, and every month the same scenario plays out. Mary gives anyone who picks her up directions to her parents' house, then on the way she instructs the driver to stop at the graveyard where she was buried. She vanishes from the car, leaving her sweater. The driver of the car tries to return the sweater to her parents' house, only to be told that Mary Talish was dead. When the SCP Foundation was made aware of Mary Talish's pattern of haunting in the late 50s, they set up a system where agents would patrol Mayflower Road at hourly intervals with the intention of picking Mary up. Agents were sent on their own, in non-Foundation cars, and instructed to stick to the accepted script of the vanishing hitchhiker legend without attempting to engage Mary in further conversation. Mary's parents were also given E-Class agent status to keep them from speaking about the haunting and told that the Foundation was working on a way to set the spirit to rest. Early attempts to study the apparition were inconclusive. It proved impossible for the Foundation to relocate her or trigger her manifestation outside of the 19th of every month, and attempts to analyze her sweater were fruitless, since if the sweater wasn't returned to the Talish family home, it would simply vanish from containment at or around sunset on the next 19th. For 20 years, SCP-1337 events continued to happen as normal. D-Class personnel under the instruction of the Foundation would pick Mary up, drive her past the cemetery, and return her sweater to her parents. It was business as usual, and in fact it was one of the more sedate reoccurring apparitions the Foundation had to deal with. But, as you might have guessed, that peace wouldn't last forever. Enter Dr. Lawson, who, in 1972, was placed in charge of all resources regarding SCP-1337. Dr. Lawson was getting sick of all this phantom hitchhiker business, and while most of the Foundation was happy to keep this routine going, Lawson thought that the continual picking up and dropping off of Mary Talish and her red sweater was a waste of the Foundation's valuable time. After all, it was the early 70s, the price of oil was at an all-time high, so the expense of sending car after car up and down the same road for a solid day once a month just to pick up a ghost was more trouble than it was worth. So Lawson started developing a plan, one that he didn't go through the proper foundation channels to approve. He reasoned that the reason Mary's ghost kept coming back was because she wanted something. Since always asked for a ride home, then it must mean she wanted to return back to her parents. So, logic followed that if she had nothing or no one to go back to, then she'd stop appearing. On the 18th of June, 1973, Lawson went ahead with his plan without his superior's knowledge and ordered the execution of Mary Talish's parents, as well as the immediate demolition of their family home. According to his journals, Lawson had hoped that his attempt at decommissioning 1337 would significantly cut the Foundation's gas bills, freeing up valuable funds, at which point he'd surely be promoted in recognition of his brilliance. But that wasn't what happened. Lawson was demoted from team leader to junior staff, and only kept on 1337 detail out of the belief that, without a family to return to, 
Lawson would become the new focal point of the haunting should Mary Talish ever return. Though Lawson's actions weren't at all above board, even by SCP Foundation standards, they did seem to have worked. The 19th of June came and went without a single Mary sighting, and she wasn't seen the next month either. A full year went by without any sign of the Mayflower Road apparition. Satisfied with this turn of events, the Foundation made the decision to officially reclassify SCP-1337 from safe to safe decommissioned, and the gas money that was budgeted for the Mayflower Road patrol was redirected to the SCP-682 Tank Acid Fund. But even though everything seemed to have been sorted out, Lawson wasn't entirely satisfied, and not just because of his demotion. Whether it was intuition or merely guilt-induced paranoia is unclear, but he suspected that Mary was still out there somewhere. Mm. At first, he thought that she might show up on the anniversary of her parents' deaths, but then that date came and went, as did eight more anniversaries after it. Finally, on the 19th of June, 1983, mm? Lawson decided he had to see for himself. Fitted with recording equipment, he drove alone, in a non-foundation standard car, down that lonely stretch of road, where so many before him had stopped to pick up that mysterious blonde woman with the red sweater. He had to prove to himself that she wouldn't show up, that he had really and truly gotten rid of her for good. It was about 5 o'clock in the evening when he reached Mayflower Road. At first, he didn't experience anything strange. He scanned the roadside, looking for the phantom hitchhiker walking along it but there was nobody there. Dr. Lawson breathed a sigh of relief. He may have orchestrated the deaths of two innocent people, but at least it hadn't been for nothing. He turned on the recorder he brought with him and logged that nothing had happened. SCP-1337 had been permanently neutralized. As he approached the T-intersection and prepared to turn onto Marsh Avenue, he looked up to adjust his rearview mirror. To his horror, he found that he wasn't alone in the car. Someone was in the seat behind him someone with blonde hair and a red sweater. His last transmission consisted only of, wait, who the hell are you? Before the recording abruptly stopped. Lawson's car was found soon after by Foundation agents. Lawson was dead in the front seat, bruised and bloody, with his eyes and heart ripped out in a ritualistic fashion, just the way Mary Talish had been found all the way back in 1952. It turns out that Mary hadn't been neutralized after all. She'd just been waiting for a chance to get revenge on the man who killed her family. And Mary didn't stop with Dr. Lawson. No longer does she appear, walking along the road waiting for someone to offer her a ride before disappearing without incident. Now, should someone pass by without offering a ride, she will appear in their back seat before reenacting the method of her own death upon the driver. And her physical appearance has changed too. Whereas before she looked like the image of a pretty young woman before her tragedy, now recordings show that she appears with the wounds of her death present, her eyes gouged out in their sockets, and a massive hole in her chest where her heart should be. The same wounds she inflicts on her victims. The SCP Foundation has tried closing off and eventually destroying the road, but that has only resulted in Mary manifesting at other locations in and around Meansea. Foundation documents reveal that any back road in the city can potentially serve as host to a 1337 event, and all attempts to contain the apparition have failed. The only way someone who has seen Mary can avoid her wrath is by stopping to pick her up, at which point she will dematerialize before reappearing on another road. Mobile task forces have been unsuccessful, as Mary only appears to those driving alone, mm -hmm. and all agents who have been sent on solo missions to apprehend her have resulted in the death of the agent. SCP-1337 was reinstated, this time as Euclid class. Currently, the Foundation's method of managing SCP-1337 is to dispatch a security team on the 19th of every month to monitor all the places where a potential sighting could take place. As soon as signs of a manifestation are identified, a remotely controlled vehicle containing a single D-Class is driven to the location. Once Mary appears in the car, the car is piloted to the empty lot where her home used to stand, and the remains of the D-Class are then disposed of. Like a lot of the stories that get passed down as urban legends, the story of SCP-1337 has a lesson that can be taken away from it. This SCP started off as an ordinary local haunting, 
no more deadly than Lydia, Suzanne, Resurrection Mary, or any of the countless other local versions of the Vanishing Hitchhiker story. But thanks to one rogue Foundation doctor and his desire to rush what he thought would be an efficient solution, the spirit not only became harder to control, but also much more violent and bloodthirsty than anyone was prepared to deal with. So if there's anything we can learn here, it's that no matter if you're a student, an office worker, or a researcher with the SCP Foundation, think twice about cutting corners. It might save you a little bit of time and money in the short term, but in the long term, the results could be fatal. The year was 1983, and seven-year-old Andrea Bradbury was wandering the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. One of her favorite activities was to head down to the local movie theater and fantasize about the movies she'd one day be old enough to see. This fateful weekend, Andrea's local theater was playing a brand new release, Jaws 3D. What she didn't know is that this simple, innocent activity would bring little Andrea into dangerous contact with SCP-178 and change her life forever. Jaws 3D isn't exactly a classic, it was one of the many forgettable sequels pumped out to cash in on the 3D craze of the early 1980s. People paid extra for the privilege of sitting in the dark with an uncomfortable pair of cardboard glasses while cheesy effects leapt out of the screen towards them. Many of the moviegoers simply threw away the cheap disposable glasses as soon as they left the theater, leaving them scattered on the sidewalk outside. Seeing a pair of 3D glasses on the ground, right there for the taking, was the highlight of little Andrea's week. She may not have been old enough to see any of the movies, but she knew that a local shop sold books with images that popped out of the page with a simple pair of 3D glasses. Excited by the prospect of getting to experience 3D, Andrea grabbed a pair of glasses and ran straight for the bookstore. Later that night, she was in her bedroom with a stereoscopic image of a Ferris wheel. Andrea adjusted the glasses and the Ferris wheel really did pop right off the page. She marveled at the image coming out of the book and felt like she could almost touch it. But suddenly, a strange feeling came over her. She had the feeling that she wasn't alone. Still wearing the glasses, Andrea looked up from her book and saw it, standing in the corner of her room, something huge, something monstrous. Andrea's parents heard her scream and came rushing into her room. There was their little girl, dead. It looked like she'd been mauled to death by a wild animal, but there was no sign of her killer. The windows were shut tight, unable to be opened from the outside. It was like whatever horrible creature had done this had vanished into thin air. The coroner's report didn't give any other clues as to who could have done this, except that whoever or whatever had murdered her, it appeared to have three long and incredibly sharp claws. The terrible tragedy of Andrea's death rocked Nashville, but it never made the national papers. Why? Because the SCP Foundation was immediately on the case. Undercover agents in the US Fish and Wildlife Service flagged the strange death as anomalous, and SCP field personnel arrived to do their own investigation of the crime scene. There, they quickly discovered Andrea's 3D glasses, which would eventually be classified as SCP-178. An agent looked over the glasses, there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary about them, just your regular cardboard frames with blue and red tinted film over the eyes. Everything about them seemed normal, so he tried the glasses on for himself. He picked up the open book off the ground where Andrea had likely dropped it, and saw the Ferris wheel pop off the page. Nothing abnormal, until he turned his head slightly. He saw the head of some kind of thing, only an inch away from his own looking over his shoulder at the book. Being a trained SCP agent, he maintained his composure and looked around the room. As he did, he saw that several other creatures were standing and watching. None of the rest of the recovery team seemed to notice the creatures, and when the agent removed SCP-178, they vanished. It appeared they had found whatever had caused Andrea Bradbury's death. The glasses were immediately taken to the nearest Foundation containment site for further testing. Seeing these mysterious entities through SCP-178 may have answered one question, but it raised many others. What are these creatures? Were they real or merely illusions created by SCP-178? If they are real, are they somehow summoned by SCP-178 or simply revealed by them? There was already one death that could be tied to the glasses with some certainty, 
But just how dangerous were they? The SCP Foundation was about to find out. Foundation scientists devised a series of experiments, with a test chamber separated from an adjoining observation chamber by a panel of reinforced bulletproof glass. A member of D-Class personnel was placed into the test chamber, along with SCP-178. He was instructed to put on the glasses and report back what he saw to the researchers. The D-Class followed the orders. However, when he did so, he quickly entered a state of extreme distress. He threw away the glasses and covered his eyes, screaming wildly. When ordered to compose himself and explain what he saw under threat of termination, the D-Class described a hideous creature standing close to his face, watching. When asked to elaborate, he described it as having too many eyes. After that, the D-Class refused to put the glasses back on again, despite direct orders and threats from Foundation staff. He was then removed from the test chamber and observed. Although he experienced two days of mild paranoia, after 30 total days of observation, the D-Class was found to have no lasting psychological effects. Disappointed by the meager results of the first test, the researchers had at least confirmed that they did have an anomalous object in their possession, and pressed on with experimentation. They used the same methodology again on another D-Class. She was placed into the chamber and instructed to put on SCP-178, then described the entity she saw in great detail. When she put on the glasses, she recoiled in horror at the monster she saw staring back at her. She said that the creature was tall and bipedal, with two additional upper appendages ending in large conical protrusions. She also described the creature's head as being smooth. When asked if the creature exhibited any kind of aggression or hostility, she said that it was completely still. It was just standing there. After a few minutes, though, the creature seemed to lose interest and began staring at the wall. The researchers were happy to learn more about the creature's physicality, but they still weren't confident that it wasn't just an illusion created by the glasses. They needed to engineer an interaction. For the next experiment, they decided to alter the particulars. A fractal blue and red image, in a similar style to the stereoscopic ferris wheel from the book Andrea had purchased, was fixed to one wall. Against the opposite wall, they placed a bucket containing 10 standard tennis balls. This time, the D-Class, a convicted murderer and arsonist, was told he was helping to test a new 3D augmented reality project. The entities he would see, as far as he knew, were little more than digital projections. Though when he actually wore SCP-178 and saw them, he commented that whoever designed them must be crazy. The researchers instructed the D-Class to pick up a tennis ball and throw it at one of the entities. The second he did so, deep lacerations began appearing all over his body. The onslaught was brutal and quick, and the D-Class was dead soon after that. This confirmed to the researchers that the creatures did seem to have some level of tangible presence, and they could be extremely violent if provoked. Next, they wished to see if it was possible to have any kind of interaction with the creatures without it immediately descending into violence. To test this theory, the researchers brought a 19-year-old D-Class into the testing chamber under the same pretense of testing new 3D technology. Much like the others, she was still horrified by the appearance of the creatures, but was calmed down by the researchers. They asked her to speak to the creatures directly, without exhibiting any kind of aggression. She said, Hello, weird thing, how are you today? In a somewhat bored voice. And this was all it took to sign her death warrant. She was immediately slashed to death by invisible creatures. The results seemed clear. Any interaction whatsoever with the creatures while wearing SCP-178 was a death sentence, like a slightly more outgoing shy guy. But the researchers would soon find that this anomaly had even more surprises. For their next test, they brought in two subjects. One would wear SCP-178 and dictate to the other how they should interact with the creature they could not see. The results of this experiment were bloody, yet informative. Both subjects were slashed to death when the unseen D-Class interacted with one of the creatures on her companion's instructions. It appeared that anyone with sufficient knowledge of the creatures who attempts to interact with them is doomed, even if they can't directly see one of them. It was an upsetting realization for the researchers. SCP-178 may be much more dangerous than they initially imagined, and what they learn in the next experiment was even worse. They adopted the same methodology as the last for the following experiment. Two subjects, one seeing and the other interacting. However, this time, as soon as subject number one put on the glasses, they knew that something was terribly wrong. He began panicking, 
stating that the entire chamber was full of the creatures, all standing and watching. The researchers undertook these experiments knowing that they didn't often turn out well for the D-Class, so they didn't seem too worried about this new development. That is, until the subjects stated that they could see three more of the creatures, and they weren't in the test chamber. They were in the observation room. In fact, one of them was looking right over one of the three researchers' shoulders. Immediately, the researchers lost composure and began to panic. They were used to putting D-Class in danger. That was part of the job, but they weren't prepared for this. In just moments, the observation room became a bloodbath, as the three researchers who'd been designing and performing all of the experiments were torn to pieces by creatures they couldn't see. SCP-178 had gone from being one of the more innocent-looking anomalies to one of the most mysterious and deadly. The creatures seemed to be powerful, violent, and incredibly numerous. The fact that they can only be observed through 178's stereoscopic lenses and kill anyone who even attempts to interact with them makes them almost impossible to understand. It was always a tragedy when the Foundation lost good researchers, but the work must continue and the experiments were soon restarted with increased safety measures. Of course, those didn't do much good, and after another disastrous experiment that resulted in the whole sector getting locked down, all research into SCP-178 was placed under increased scrutiny. They needed to find some way of observing the creatures without the risk of having to share space with them. The proposed solution was seeing if the SCP-178 glasses were compatible with camera technology for remote viewing. Much like all stereoscopic glasses, they found that looking through only one lens at a time was ineffective. The solution was relatively simple. A dual lens camera in a roughly similar configuration to human eyes. This, however, didn't give them the comfort or the answers they hoped for. Researchers commented, upon finally seeing the creatures, that they were even more hideous than they'd ever imagined. As they observed a victim interacting with the creatures via their new camera, they found that as soon as the creatures were interacted with in any way, they would grow three long claws and attack. And they were as fast as they were ferocious. From the observations, there were only a few things that the Foundation now knew about them for sure. Their physical appearance, their violent nature, their enhanced physical abilities, and the fact they appear to be pretty much everywhere. And who knows how long they'd been here, observing us humans while we glided by them, ignorant to their presence. It's enough to make you think twice before putting on a pair of 3D glasses again. But of course, never putting on the glasses doesn't mean you're safe. Just knowing about them puts you in danger. They could be standing next to you right now, looking over your shoulder as you watch this video. Just remember, if you want to be safe, you can't ever let them know you're aware. After all, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it can't hurt you. Dr. Seymour Tracy is an ordinary American man. He lives in a two-bedroom home with a white picket fence in an ordinary suburban town in the Midwest. He gets up every day and goes to work. Then in the evening, he comes home to spend time with his family. From the outside, Seymour and his family couldn't be more normal. But in reality, there's something very abnormal about him, his life, and the neighborhood where he lives. Seymour Tracy isn't just some office worker. He's a researcher employed by the SCP Foundation, just like all of his neighbors. Because this isn't an ordinary neighborhood. It's a functioning Site 11 satellite facility, bought and maintained by the Foundation for the sole purpose of containing and monitoring a single SCP, SCP-3082. SCP-3082 is an ordinary treehouse, 2 meters by 2 meters in size and built from ordinary cherry wood planks and it's located in one of the trees in the neighborhood park. You might expect that an anomaly that requires an entire suburb of people to monitor it is exceptionally difficult to contain. But the truth is, SCP-3082 is only a Euclid-class anomaly, fairly tame by Foundation standards. The fact that the houses surrounding this SCP are inhabited solely by Foundation personnel and their families is, more than anything, a way to keep up appearances of this being a completely normal neighborhood. Unlike most Foundation sites, the personnel working in this unorthodox setup around SCP-3082 are mostly researchers, and their work is just as much anthropological and diplomatic as it is scientific. As you might have guessed, SCP-3082 isn't a normal treehouse on the inside. 
open up this small hatch in the wall and step through, and you'll find yourself in a much larger, grander treehouse that rests on the upper branches of an absolutely massive conifer-like tree of an unidentified species. The tree, designated as SCP-3082-1, is an incredible 160 kilometers tall, and while its own species is not known, it appears to have multiple recognizable plants grafted onto and growing out of its bark. Many of these plants are fruit-bearing, and in addition to the identifiable plants, there are also a number of pitcher plant-like flowers that collect and hold fresh water. These plants serve as sustenance for the only known inhabitants of SCP-3082, a colony of around 74 children, all between the ages of 4 and 12. These children live in a village made up of other tree houses built among the branches of SCP-3082-1, and all of them match the descriptions of children from around the United States who went missing between 1996 and the present day. Curiously, within SCP-3082's pocket dimension, the children don't physically age, and while Foundation personnel can move freely back and forth through the hatch in SCP-3082's wall, children under the age of 13 are unable to cross back through once inside the pocket dimension. It's a very extraordinary anomaly, but it was up to the very ordinary Dr. Tracy to make contact with the residents of SCP-3082. Upon entering, he discovered that the children had formed their own system of government, known as the Chief Royal Council. Dr. Tracy was introduced to many of the Council's members, including Wexley Olson, age 6, a junior Council member, Lucy Fujimoto, age 7, who had taken the role of City Planner and Resource Manager, Ahmed Saeed, age 11, who served as a caretaker to the younger citizens of SCP-3082, and Rachel Jeffries, age 10, who acted as a Council Mediator. Through interviews with the subjects, Dr. Tracy found that all 74 of the children reported they had woken up on the porch of a treehouse after running away from troubled homes. Most of the council members had disappeared in 1996, except for Olson, who disappeared in 2005. Older residents reported that some of the treehouse that make up what is now their village were already there upon their discovery of the pocket dimension. Also pre-existing within the pocket dimension was the original leader of the Chief Royal Council, a 12-year-old girl from Ohio named Aria Morrison. The Foundation was eager to speak to Morrison, as she was seemingly the first child to discover SCP-3082. But when Dr. Tracy asked the other children where she was, they told him that they didn't know. According to Saeed and Jeffries, Morrison abandoned the colony five months before the Foundation's arrival. It was unclear where she could have gone, as drone exploration conducted by the Foundation revealed that SCP-3082-1 was the only large living thing for miles within the pocket dimension. While the tree was thriving, the surrounding area was mostly flat, decaying, and barren. Further research into Morrison's history showed that her younger sister, Jacqueline Morrison, had also gone missing on the same night, but there was no evidence that Jacqueline had ever entered SCP-3082. The Foundation conducted their research into the biology of SCP-3082-1 while maintaining diplomatic relations with the Pocket Dimension citizens. Taking advantage of the fact that adults could move freely in and out of the hatch, the Foundation started working with the Chief Royal Council to improve the weight limits on the village systems of rope bridges, as well as providing any supplies that the children might need, such as additional food, clothing, and medical equipment. These liaisons were extremely helpful for the children, many of whom had been without adult supervision or care for over a decade. Saeed, for one example, had fallen off of a bridge and broken his leg several years earlier, and had been living with the pain caused from the bone being incorrectly set ever since. However, there was an unexpected side effect of this continued contact. While the Foundation tried to remain neutral in their involvement in the policies of 3082, through Dr. Tracy's interviews, he discovered that the SCP Foundation's presence in the treehouse had caused a schism within the Chief Royal Council. The vast majority of the children, including Saeed, Jeffries, and Fujimoto, supported the Foundation's presence and wanted to work with them to find a way to leave the world of 3082 and return back to what the children called the real world. But a splinter group had developed, 
calling themselves the Neverland Movement. The Neverland Movement were angered by the Foundation's interference and intended to resist any attempt to return the children to civilization. Olsen had become the de facto leader of the Splinter Group and made no secrets about his views on the Foundation. He swore at Tracy during interviews and frequently butted heads with the rest of the Council, Fujimoto in particular. At one point, Tracy overheard the two of them fighting, with Olsen arguing that Neverland gives them everything they need without any grown-ups to tell them what to do, and that they would be stupid to give that up. To which Fujimoto responded, I was here back when we were still building the village. I was here before we had safety nets, ladders, and fences, and before we figured out how to build a treehouse that wouldn't fall apart if someone leaned on a bad wall. I was here before we knew where there was more food if we needed it. When did you get here, huh? After we knew what we were doing. Listening to the conversation, Dr. Tracy heard the children refer again to Arya Morrison in a way that suggested that she had some kind of control over the environment. In reference to the incident where Saeed had broken his leg, Fujimoto said, Mary didn't fix his leg right, and this place didn't fix it either. Arya prayed, and you know what happened? Nothing. From this comment, the Foundation started to theorize that Arya had somehow been involved in the creation of SCP-3082, and Arya was officially designated as SCP-3082-2. One morning, when Dr. Tracy entered the treehouse and walked through the hatch to conduct further interviews, he was greeted by Olsen, who was the only child in the main treehouse at the time. Tracy asked what was wrong, and Olsen explained that the tree had started to change. A wooden slide had appeared between two of the tree's fruit-bearing branches, snapping the rope bridge and making the fruit more difficult to access. On top of that, Olsen said that the apples the trees produced were different now. They looked like apples from the outside, but now seemed to be made of cotton candy on the inside. Dr. Tracy put in a request for non-perishable foods to be sent through into the pocket dimension, fearing that further changes to the tree structure would mean the children would be deprived of enough proper nutrition to survive. Given these changes, it became apparent that more had to be done to understand the tree's physiology. An exploratory drone was sent into the dimension, with cameras and sensors collecting data on the lower parts of the tree that the children hadn't colonized. The expedition continued as normal, until the drone operators spotted a hollow in the tree that had not yet been documented. The cameras detected movement inside the hollow, and on closer inspection, the operators were shocked to find it was a person. More specifically, it was Arya Morrison. The cameras were only just able to confirm her identity though, as the drone was knocked out of the sky by a falling watermelon and the feed was cut. Before the request for a replacement drone could even be approved though, the broken drone started transmitting again. In front of the camera was Morrison, clutching a roll of duct tape. She explained to the camera that she'd rewired the drone to resume the camera feed and remove some of the drone's fan blades. Using a system where the operators of the drone would rotate the remaining blades once for yes and twice for no, the Foundation was able to hold a conversation with Morrison. She confirmed much of the information that the Foundation already had on her, that she was from Ohio, and that she and her sister Jacqueline had disappeared in 1996. During the conversation, Morrison wrote down a Morse code-like system through which to communicate more complex questions and answers, and with the help of this Morrison code, the Foundation was able to conduct a series of more in-depth interviews with the subject. The first interview occurred 44 hours after first making contact, and the drone operators explained to her the nature of the SCP Foundation in basic terms. They assured her that the other children were still safe in the village, but Morrison didn't volunteer any more information about herself. Nine days later, though, she finally told the Foundation her story. Aria and Jacqueline Morrison had a difficult childhood together. Their parents fought constantly and would often leave their sisters at home without supervision for long periods of time. Jacqueline, perhaps aided by all the time she spent alone, displayed an extremely active imagination. So active, in fact, that Aria claimed she was able to pull things out of thin air warping reality around her to fit her imagined scenarios. Arya recalled that one year when the Morrison parents had forgotten Jacqueline's birthday, Arya tried to comfort her by saying that the family had been planning a surprise party for Jacqueline's half-birthday instead. She forgot all about the white lie until six months later, when the girl's parents took them to the park and everything Arya had told Jacqueline would be at her half-birthday was there waiting for them. Knowing the potential consequences of letting Jacqueline's power go unchecked, 
Arya always made sure to remind her sister to turn things back to normal after they played pretend together. One night in 1996, while their parents were having a particularly bad fight, the sisters packed a bag and ran off into the woods. After about half an hour, they got turned around, but they kept walking, just as afraid of what would happen to them if they went back home as they were of being lost in the woods. Arya lost track of Jacqueline for a moment, and suddenly found herself standing on the porch of SCP-3082. Unable to find Jacqueline anywhere, Arya searched the treehouse, and in the process, became trapped in SCP-3082's pocket dimension. The treehouse inside the pocket dimension appeared exactly as it does now, but the rest of the tree was devoid of life. Scared, alone, and running out of water, Arya sat in the treehouse and, pretending that her sister was with her, started telling a bedtime story about fruit trees and pitchers of fresh water. The next day, she awoke to find a system of rope bridges and a grove where SCP-3082-1's fruit-bearing trees and pitcher plants had sprouted overnight. Arya found that when it was in a giving mood, the tree would respond to any requests she made. More children started to appear over time, and they started making additions to the village with the tree's help. They would get what they needed to survive, but the tree refused to let them go. In Arya Morrison's own words, Jacqueline likes it too much here in Neverland. I think Jackie might listen better if I get closer to the part of her that remembers. But for now, she doesn't hear me when I say it's time to go home. Trees don't really think like people do. And so, the children continue to live in the world of SCP-3082 to this day, as a whole town of SCP Foundation personnel work to bring them back. And hopefully, if they are able to return to the real world, they'll find it's the world they deserve. You hear their footsteps coming down the halls. Or are those your own? Can you even tell the difference? You can tell they're getting closer and you can feel the hate, the rage. You turn, shaking, and finally see them standing right in front of you. But in that moment, you might as well be looking into a mirror. And who knows? Perhaps you are. You just don't seem to remember having so many reflections. Have you ever heard the saying, you are your own worst enemy? Of course, it isn't usually meant literally, but what if it was? What if you had to fight a monster that was you? All of your flaws are reflected back at you. Your strengths, your weaknesses, your deepest fears with no way to escape except a battle to the death. Either way, you're not making it out alive. It's just a matter of which version of you survives. But this isn't a thought experiment. No, according to the findings of the SCP Foundation, it's very much a reality. There is a place where this nightmare comes to life, and it's known as SCP-1919. SCP-1919 is a hotel and converted mansion built in the early 20th century. From the outside, it looks pretty much like it did when it was first built and it almost looks like a comfortable place to stay, if you ignore the eastern side of the building that has sunk partially into the ground. The inside, however, is a different story, where it's clear the ravages of time have taken their toll. The floorboards and ceilings are rotting, collapsing in on themselves, and the rooms are filled with debris. It's deadly enough to explore the hotel for these reasons alone, but this is only the beginning of the danger for a person inside. In order to determine just how dangerous it is for either one person or group to enter the structure, the SCP Foundation planned a series of research expeditions into the abandoned building, led by Foundation scientist Dr. Lemkowitz. The first expedition seemed relatively normal, at least it did at the start. A 39-year-old Caucasian D-Class male, known as D-7, was sent into the structure with a camera and a communication system, guided remotely by Dr. Limkowitz, or Dr. L, and another operative, a former head of the MTF Tau-11 Youth Hostiles, who is referred to in this file only as T-11. When he arrived at the building, D-7 was unable to get inside through the front door or windows. After several minutes of trial and error, he was finally able to get in through the western entrance. Dr. L picked up a strange, high-pitched whistling noise upon D-7's entrance into the building, but it quickly faded away and was disregarded by T-11. D-7 discovered a torn painting, a portrait of a young woman with red hair. Next to the portrait, shallow scratches could be seen in the wall, the floor, and parts of the ceiling. Suddenly, D-7 ducked into a hiding place alarmed. 
He and the other two operatives listening to his audio feed could hear heavy breathing, and it didn't belong to D7. Dr. L recommended that D7 evacuate the building at this sign of another entity inside, but T11 overruled ordering him to disregard that instruction and continue his investigation. D7 was told to stay at a safe distance from whatever was inside with him, and attempt to capture it on video. D7 turned off his flashlight in order to better hide, but T11 commanded that he turn it back on. Whatever was caught in the beam of light was difficult for the camera to see, but it threw D7 into a panic, and he began to run in the opposite direction. When prompted to explain what he saw, D7 simply said, it was me. D7 ran through the dark, panting with fear and exertion. Unable to see where his feet were landing, he tripped over something and came crashing onto the ground, dropping the video camera. This allowed the observing officers to finally see what D7 was so frightened by, and it became clear just why D7 was so terrified. A man, identical looking to D7, approached from the end of the hallway making its way towards the real D7. It was followed by another man who also resembled D7 and another, all running toward the original. They all looked exactly like him, with a few notable differences. They were dressed in the same uniform, with the same build and the same features, but each had something slightly off about him. One was missing eyelids, another had malformed hands, and the third had its lips fused together into a fleshy mass beneath its nose. Dr. L moved to cut the camera feed, but T11 demanded that it be kept running. D7 couldn't be seen by the camera, but the microphone picked up the sounds of flesh and cloth being torn, along with pained, panic screams as the duplicates set upon him. After a moment, the screaming stopped. Two hours later, the camera was broken, and the expedition brought to a troubling end. This was the Foundation's first glimpse at the creatures inside of SCP-1919, and it was not pretty. It did, however, allow them to begin understanding the nature of the building and what happens when a person goes inside. It appears that when a human enters the hotel, several humanoid creatures manifest throughout the building. These creatures look like the subject and are equipped with the same clothing or items that the subject brought inside with them. Though they are nearly mirror images of the subject, they are always slightly warped in a variety of ways. These have included changes to limb and digit length, joint mobility, sealed nostrils, lengthened jaws hanging loose and limp, missing eyelids, and lips that are fused together. These creatures are highly aggressive towards the structure of the building itself, as well as to the subject that they resemble. They do not, however, attack each other. They appear to operate with a hive mind, exhibiting swarm intelligence like that of an ant colony. Once they have been spawned by the entrance of a new person, they will not stop until said person either escapes the building or is killed. After the unfortunate end to the expedition, the Foundation prepped for a second trip inside. This time, three men were sent in with Dr. L's guidance, known as D3, D4, and D9. Video cameras were sewn into their clothes to leave their hands free and help avoid some of the issues that came up during the first expedition. This small team was sent in with the orders to terminate the remaining copies of D7 and further examine the hotel's interior. Upon opening the door to the building, they were immediately attacked by one of D7's copies, which D9 was able to quickly dispatch by firing his weapon at its head. Next, after a great deal of reluctance, the three men entered the building where they spotted something unusual inside. Dr. L was horrified when the camera feed revealed 17 discarded video cameras spread across the floor. They didn't have much time to react to this new discovery, however, because two doubles, one mirroring D7 and another mirroring D9, emerged from the wall and began to attack. Dr. L ordered the team to take shelter then called the team of guards outside of the hotel's perimeter. They were ordered to begin an immediate full perimeter lockdown, preventing the doubles from leaving the hotel. D3, D4, and D9 attempted to make their way to a safe corner of the building, but found themselves met with a murderous double at every turn. At this point, Dr. L began to hear an unusual sound over the microphone feed, a high-pitched whine like that of a dentist drill. The operatives on the ground couldn't hear a thing, but on Dr. L's end, it was deafening. As the team proceeded deeper into the hotel, they became overcome with a strange feeling of foreboding. Dr. L ordered them to turn on their flashlights, but they refused and begged Dr. L to keep quiet. When prompted to explain, D9 said, She can hear you. The operatives stopped responding, 
but their camera feeds caught a faint glowing white light coming from beneath a door. The door opened, and the light flooded the camera, making the images it captured hard to decipher. Just a few frames of a quick-moving female silhouette were captured before the cameras cut to static. The bodies of D3, D4, and D9 were never recovered, nor were their cameras. A third expedition was also sent into SCP-1919, but very little is known about what occurred during it. The video transcript is highly classified, and only those present for its events or proved to research SCP-1919 have access to it. An update to the SCP-1919 file following Expedition 3, though, indicates that new information was revealed about the hotel during the excursion. According to the file update, there is some kind of being at the center of the location, which is causing all of the other creatures, the doubles, to appear. The only information available about this being is the use of the word her in the official foundation log about SCP-1919. This seems to match up with the last moments of the operatives in Expedition 2, when they told Dr. L that she can hear you and the few frames of a female figure that were captured by their cameras. Nothing else is known that has been made available to anyone outside a very select few. Only the original report exists, and all other copies of it have been destroyed. The Foundation has undertaken special containment procedures to make sure that none of the entities from inside the hotel escape, whether they are the evil twins spawned by humans entering the building, or the mysterious female being at the center of the entire disturbing phenomenon. The Foundation has classified SCP-1919 as Euclid, and a two-kilometer radius must be maintained around SCP-1919, with all roads leading to the building are blocked or diverted so that no vehicles are able to reach it. This perimeter is guarded by a set of at least 40 armed and armored guards at any given time, as it has been determined that the doubles spawned by 1919 are equipped with whatever the human they are copying has. No one is allowed to enter the hotel with body armor or weapons of any kind. Anyone that approaches the perimeter that is not a part of an official expedition team will be immediately terminated. No new expedition teams are allowed to enter the building unless all doubles from the previous expedition have been exterminated. In the event that they cannot be exterminated, enough time must elapse between expeditions that the previous doubles have starved to death. Though they do not seem to feel hunger, the doubles do need to eat to survive, and will die when left alone for long enough. SCP-1919 has been sealed off from the rest of the world so that no hapless civilians can wander inside and find themselves torn to pieces by warped images of themselves. But that comfort turns cold when you realize that the SCP Foundation still does not understand what causes these doubles to spawn. Is it scientific, supernatural, or something else? No one can be certain. Even more inexplicable is the entity at the center of all of this an unknown female presence capable of wrecking frightening amounts of violence by turning victims' own images against them. What is the purpose of these funhouse mirror nightmares? Who is she? What is she? And what does she want? Currently, the doubles have shown no interest in leaving the hotel except to attack intruders, and thanks to that fact, as well as the reinforced perimeter outside, these copycats have not appeared outside of the building itself. But what happens if they do escape? or if the entity that controls them decides to make her home elsewhere. There is no telling what could happen if this dark power is allowed to move beyond its current containment. Are you prepared to fight a vision of yourself, twisted almost beyond recognition, lunging after you with wide bulbous eyes, unnaturally long arms, and a distended jaw hanging down below its neck? Better hope you never have to find out. Everyone loves a good ghost story. Whether you're crowded around a campfire or watching a YouTube video at 3am, there's something fun and exciting about imagining haunted places plagued by strange noises and apparitions. Part of what makes it so fun is the idea that any place can be haunted, especially if terrible things have happened there. That decrepit old house at the end of your street, that 80-year-old movie theater where no one goes anymore, a park where one too many kids went missing. All it takes is a tragic backstory and a creepy atmosphere, and it's easy to believe that any place could be teeming with restless spirits. So it stands to reason that a place with as many unsolved deaths as the SCP Foundation might have a ghost or two lurking in the shadows. 
If you've ever suspected that the SCP Foundation might be haunted, well, you'd be right. It began as all good ghost stories do, with a series of frightening, unexplained events. Some time ago, personnel at SCP Foundation Site 30 began to notice strange things happening around the facility. Obviously at a place like an SCP Foundation containment site, strange is relative. But these events seemed to have nothing to do with any of the entities contained at the site. There were unexplained sounds reported in the private quarters of agents and researchers, ranging from whispers to screams from an unseen being. Personnel who approached the D-Class block at the site noticed an immediate drop in temperature, with some employees claiming that they could even see their own breath. Several personnel reported items going missing while they were alone in a room. Most were small and easily misplaced objects like pens and clipboards, but one man said his wallet disappeared which wouldn't be that strange if it hadn't been securely inside his lab coat. Other personnel would be innocently washing their hands, only to be horrified by the appearance of a bloody figure in a D-Class jumpsuit in the mirror, staring back at them with hatred in its eyes. There were anomalous computer server errors, the feeling of being watched or followed by some menacing invisible force, even the sight of a shadowy silhouette fleeing down corridors and hiding around corners. All of these occurrences were reported to higher-ups at the Foundation, but they were all dismissed. The directorial board of the site insisted that these accounts were likely the result of employees cracking under the immense mental stress of working under such strenuous circumstances. If left alone, they were certain that the reports would stop. But the reports didn't stop, and they soon found out that this was only the beginning. There was an uptick in containment breaches following these initial reports. In total, 12 different entities were released from their containment, and the origin of these breaches could not be identified. Thankfully, the entities were captured and returned to their containment facilities before any casualties could result. But from there, things kept getting worse. Over the course of several months, there were six different employee suicides on site. Security footage of the deceased operatives shortly before their deaths showed them acting deeply troubled engaging in agitated conversation with someone not visible to the camera. At first, it was posited that whoever was upsetting the employees was in a blind spot, but it quickly became clear that the dead employees were being tormented by something invisible. Stories of hauntings were one thing, but now with escaped SCPs and a notable death count, the directorial board decided to mount an official investigation into the unexplained occurrences. It was then that the spirit was officially acknowledged, identified, and reclassified as SCP-4973. SCP-4973 was once a D-Class worker who was used as a guinea pig in 25 different experiments with a variety of entities on site. He was reportedly exposed to multiple unusual and dangerous anomalies, including SCP-158, a large mechanical arm capable of extracting an unidentified substance from any living test subject. Before he was brought on board at SCP Foundation Site 30, he was also known as Gordon Karviakoulis Markovich, a man who had been convicted of murder in the second degree after stabbing his wife 24 times in the chest with a kitchen knife. During his incarceration, Markovich was transferred to the custody of the SCP Foundation and placed at Site 30, where he was given a new name. D-10,000. During an experiment involving a redacted entity, D-10,000 was killed, and his remains were disposed of at a nearby waste refinery. It was then only three months after his death that the initial reports of ghost activity began. SCP-4973 is regarded as a Class IV spectral entity, meaning that it is an entity displaying a high degree of aggression and malevolence towards a specific individual or group. In this case, the spirit displays hostility towards a very specific group, the SCP Foundation. Class IV entities can affect the environment around them, move objects, reduce the temperature in a room, and induce hallucinations in humans that it comes into contact with. These hallucinations are thought to be the cause of the increase in employee suicides that occurred after 4973's first appearance. One of the many ways in which SCP-4973 acted out, in what is believed to be an attempt at revenge on the Foundation as a whole, was to somehow gain access to the SkipNet database terminal. This allowed the spirit to learn about the entities contained at the site, as well as personal details regarding the lives of research, security, and administrative staff working there. 
This information is likely what allowed 4973 to cause several suspected containment breaches, though the specifics of those breaches have been expunged from official records. 4973 was eventually contained within an apparatus known as the Incorporeal Entity Vacuum Chamber, which is constantly monitored by a team of specialists within MTF Mu-13, affectionately nicknamed Ghostbusters. In order to prevent it from escaping, four Harrington Hollow neutralizer wards have been placed at the door to the containment facility. This containment method has been largely effective, though the spirit had escaped a handful of times and had to be recaptured and placed back into the IEVC. In order to understand SCP-4973 and how it was able to access the database, Dr. Lorraine Casper was assigned to conduct an interview with the spirit, speaking to it as it was in containment and a transcript of this interview is available in the official Foundation archives. Dr. Casper began the conversation politely, addressing the SCP as Gordon and asking him how he was. Gordon refused to comply with the round of questioning, going as far as to yell at Dr. Casper until she reminded him that he faced the risk of termination if he refused to answer her questions. Dr. Casper pointed out that the files accessed by 4973 required clearance that the spirit would have no way of possessing. He responded that he simply waved his hand across the terminal in order to access it, explaining, It freaked out for a second, then just stopped. I could just move my fingers around the air and the tabs would just roll up. Easy as that. Dr. Casper asked for clarification, inquiring how he could even do something like that. 4973 continued his explanation. Beats me. It felt like some attraction, like magnets from afar getting closer and closer, I don't know, something like that. Finding this answer unsatisfactory, Dr. Casper pushed further, asking for an explanation of SCP-4973's attempts to release dangerous on-site anomalies from containment. This question seemed to stump him, and he claimed not to understand what Dr. Casper meant. She explained that the ID cards of Dr. Yurkov and Dr. Orson were used to open the facilities from which these anomalies escaped. 4973 was shocked that he had even been suspected of this attack, and insisted not to know who Orson or Yurkov even were. All of a sudden, he trailed off. There was silence for a moment, and Dr. Casper began to collect her notes and leave, assuming that the interview was over. Much to her surprise, SCP-4973 began to laugh, a loud, uproarious laugh of complete and utter delight. Casper asked what 4973 was laughing about, and was met with the response, God, this whole time you and your ghost hunting crew never knew? He refused to clarify what it was the doctor and her crew had missed, only saying, God, that look on your face when you find out it's been right under your nose this whole time. He continued to laugh at Dr. Casper for the remainder of the interview, refusing to answer any further questions or explain any of his comments. Finally, Dr. Casper grew exasperated and left, ending the interview for real this time. Following this perplexing interview, Dr. Casper inexplicably abandoned her post at Site-30. Her supervisors could not reach her, neither could any of the other researchers at the site. No one had heard from her for an entire week, until one day she called Director Eric Riverson of Site-30 on his personal phone line. He recorded the conversation, and a transcript has been included in the file for SCP-4973. Dr. Casper explained to Director Riverson that she had been hiding in her private residence away from the site, and that she no longer considered any part of the site safe. In fact, she suggested that all SCP Foundation sites might be potentially compromised. She explained her conversation with SCP-4973, and the questions it provoked her to ask. If he had not been behind the containment breaches, then who was? He never encountered Dr. Yurkov or Orson in any of the tests administered on him, and Orson wasn't even employed at the Foundation until after 4973's death. Dr. Casper posited that, though the spirit of Gordon was not responsible for the breaches, another spectral force or forces at the site might be. Her hypothesis, that Site-30 was positively infested with the vengeful spirits of Class D employees lost over the years during various experiments. In order to prove her theory, Dr. Casper got her hands on all the experimental equipment used by the department researching spectral anomalies. The general consensus among researchers in this field is that spirits leak out a kind of energy, known as ectoplasm, wherever they go. 
It has been compared to the skin left behind when a spider or a snake molts, a non-essential portion of the entity that is shed and leaves a residue in areas where they have been. Unsurprisingly, a huge amount of ectoplasm was detected inside of Site-30. The spirits were undetected at first, as many of them were dormant for quite some time. Dormant spirits are spirits that are not aware of their surroundings or the circumstances of their deaths, and they do not emit large quantities of ectoplasm. It is likely that after Gordon was trapped, Several of the dormant spirits of Site-30 began to remember what was done to them, and manifest in more aggressive ways. Because Gordon was presumed to be the only spirit at the site, their gradual appearance and acting out was either ignored or presumed to be Gordon escaping from containment. After her realization, Dr. Casper identified an additional five active spirits at the site, and was able to capture and contain one of them. Dr. Casper warned Director Riverson that there were likely far more spirits than just those five, and it was only a matter of time before they woke up and became active like the others. The large amount of previous containment breaches attributed to simple human error becomes deeply sinister once it is clear that there have been vengeful spirits hiding in plain sight the entire time. As Gordon put it in his interview, they were just under their noses the whole time. Dr. Casper's findings and the story of Site-30 present a troubling possibility. Every SCP Foundation site has used massive amounts of Class D personnel and human experiments with dangerous entities, and the body count at nearly all of them is staggering. If Dr. Casper is right, then every single site has the makings of a haunted house. All of them could be infested with the spirits of dead, angry D-Class, who are just waiting to wake up and take their revenge on the still-living members of the organization that killed them. And it's only a matter of time before they get the chance. You've just had a night of your life in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. You spend hours shooting craps, dancing in clubs, and eating more than your fill at the famous all-you-can-eat buffets. You're staggering back to your hotel room, high on life in the early hours of the morning when you notice something strange. A long, dark tunnel just off the side of the strip. You didn't notice it on the way in, perhaps because you were distracted by all the glitz, glamour, and hypnotic casino lights. You see the tunnel, and your overstimulated mind feels drawn to it. You stumble in and start walking. During your walk, you can feel your bones cracking. They don't shatter like you've just been hit by a train. They shift. You feel the entire shape of you bending into something different, but it doesn't stop with your skeleton. Your organs start to feel strange, and then your skin. In the complete darkness of the tunnel, you have no idea what's going on, so you just keep walking. Eventually, you find your way into a lush green forest. It's beautiful, but it feels like it should be a million miles away from the arid desert of Nevada. You were only in the tunnel for a few minutes. What gives? Hello? You call out. Is anybody there? No answer. You explore further into this empty forest. Its trees are far as the eye can see, but no animals. That's when you see something that catches your eye. A puddle of crystal clear water. But it's not the puddle itself that draws your attention. It's what reflects back at you when you stare into it. At first, you can hardly believe it. But as you move your mouth in shock and the reflection moves its mouth too, it's suddenly all too real. You've been turned into a fox, an orange, bushy-tailed fox. You scream and bolt all the way back to the tunnel that led you here. You sprint through and feel your entire body changing once more. When you finally hit the wall of dry Vegas heat on the other side, you're human again. You breathe a sigh of relief and stumble back to your hotel room. The next day, you only vaguely remember what happened, and because you're not crazy, you assume it was just all a wild dream. What you just encountered is a Euclid-class SCP known as SCP-2746, a seemingly innocent tunnel near the Vegas Strip, which holds a portal to a fantastical world designated by the Foundation as SCP-2746-1. By the time the Foundation discovered and secured the SCP-2746 tunnel, and began sending their field agents and researchers on fact-finding expeditions inside, the place was already a ghost town. A forested landmass approximately 111 kilometers in diameter 
with no notable signs of life. The Foundation discovered that this place had a strange effect on people and animals who came in from our world. Humans who entered assumed the form of a random animal, but retained their intelligence and vocal cords, creating talking animals. Animals brought into 2746-1 retained their animalistic intelligence, but grew human-like vocal cords, allowing them to repeat simple phrases. Before the mass exodus or extinction event that left 2746-1 barren, the Foundation figured out that this place was populated by a whole civilization of intelligent animals, like something out of a fairy tale. These animals, through a mix of brains and magic, were able to leave written records and create impressive architecture, like homes and places of worship. Foundation researchers became fascinated with how exactly this society operated and what could have led to its sudden downfall. Thanks to a mix of advanced archaeology and records left behind by the creatures, this is what the Foundation determined. The society these talking, intelligent animals lived in was a kind of religious oligarchy, meaning power was consolidated by the few in the top social class. Society was divided into three segments, crafters, scholars, and honorables, with the crafters being the most powerful members of society and honorables being the least powerful. The state-sponsored churches acted in worship of a being simply called the Maker, who fills a similar role to the Abrahamic God. The crafters, whose number totaled 13, were believed to be immortal and were responsible for building the majority of the culture and architecture found in 2746-1. The scholars acted as their wise assistants, and the honorables were a mixed class of artists, carpenters, and artisans. It seemed that this culture had a pretty good thing going. No system of currency was ever invented, and the economy operated on a barter system. The Foundation believes that, initially, the citizens of this world didn't need to eat to survive, and so only needed to barter for material goods. Though it's worth noting that the conditions of immortality only apply to natives of this region. People born on Earth but assuming animal forms while entering 2746-1 still need nutrition to survive. However, a great tragedy soon caused a fundamental shift in the balance of life and society within 2746-1. The Maker decided it wanted to test or punish its subjects with two major changes. First, humans would be forbidden from entering the domain. And second, the Maker now made the consumption of food necessary for continued survival and sanity. Nothing was ever the same. Because nobody had needed to eat prior to this, food stores had never been made, and the inhabitants had no agricultural knowledge that would allow them to easily mass-produce more. As a result, while the crafters and scholars were able to feed on fruits from luxurious private gardens, the honorables were forced to resort to eating each other, or other inhabitants of 2746-1. This began a bloody rift that split society from the top down. One half, led by the powerful crafters Sari and Suward, wanted to preserve society as it was and continue to worship the Maker. Sari took the form of a Flemish giant rabbit, and Suward appeared as a house cat. The opposition, led by former crafters Frederick and Agathos, with the reluctant help of a scholar named Clovis, wanted to get revenge on the Maker for all he'd done and kill him completely altering society. Don't be fooled by their appearances, though. Many of the inhabitants of 2746-1 were fiercely intelligent sorcerers, and the apocalyptic civil war they sparked came to be known to the Foundation as Event Nachash. Like many wars, there would be no real winners here, only survivors. And even then, not for long. It was a bloody and horrific war. All attempts at finding a diplomatic solution failed. Frederick and Agathos would not stop until they had the Maker's blood on their paws. In the end, though, they were defeated. And for their traitorous crimes, they were to be punished by Sari and Suward in horrific ways to make examples of them. Since neither could die, they were given fates worse than death instead. Frederick was up first. Before the war, he'd been a leader prized for his courage and ingenuity. He'd created something known as the Great Fire which provided the kingdom with light. For his so-called atrocities against the Maker, he was given the punishment of permanent crucifixion and relocation to a place known as the Underplane. His snout was cut off his face, and he was set permanently ablaze in a manner that would leave him forever suffering and would make him appear to look like a monster to all. 
Next went Agathos. She was Frederick's sister and was seen as the mastermind of many of their schemes. She would be forever encased in white clay and bled through her eyes until the sin drains from her. She's now a living, crying statue, existing in a state of permanent imprisonment for her part in the crimes against the Maker. Clovis, because her involvement in the coup was unwilling, was given a more minor punishment. One of her eyes was removed, and she was permanently placed in a broken human body, effectively banishing her from her home in 2746-1 forever. Though they may have won, things didn't end much better for Sari and Siwa. The Civil War had fractured their world, and in the aftermath, the survivors chose to leave in hopes of finding a better life elsewhere. Sari and Siwa, though, felt partially responsible for everything that had happened, and so they decided to remain in their dying world. Before they themselves died, or perhaps moved on to different forms, leaving their animal bodies behind, they left a final note. It was from this note that the Foundation learned much of the story of SCP-2746. This may seem like a pretty open and shut mm. case, another magical realm destroyed by tragedy and civil war, much like the land of fantasy in SCP-1762. But what's really bizarre here is that this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the stories of some of these key figures in the event Nahash. First, what became of the two rebels, Agathos and Frederick? Today, they're two parts of the feared and deadly SCP-1913. Frederick, now going by Freddy, is a nightmarish faceless fire demon in the form of a dog, slavishly devoted to the protection of his sister, Agathos, now known as Agatha, still trapped in white clay, her leaking blood now deadly to the touch. Clovis is still believed to be in league with Agathos and Frederick, and may now be related to the sinister SCP-1903, a one-eyed rabbit-like human. But strangest of all is the possible truth behind Sari and Sewer, the two devotees to the Maker who remained in 2746-1 until their very last breath. In all likelihood, these two were once agents of the SCP Foundation's infamous Las Vegas branch. They took on these more animalistic forms after their deaths. Sari may have once been Agent Sarah Crowley, a Japanese-American woman who died in the line of duty in 1960. Seward was once Dr. Stuart Hayward, Crowley's partner, his new name acting as a kind of fusion of the first and last name he had in life. This is only the beginning of the animal-themed weirdness occurring around Site 45, the Foundation's Vegas branch. But this series of anomalies, collected under the term Pitch Haven, will have to wait for another video. After all, you know what they say. What happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. From far away in orbits around the Earth, the nuclear holocaust almost looked beautiful. Bright white pinpricks dotting the planet's surface glinted up at the escaping jet. For generations, much of humanity had lived in fear that the destruction of the world would come from countries launching nuclear weapons at each other. No one expected it to come when they started launching them against themselves. The invasion of the weasels had been as savage as it was swift. Much of the human population had been wiped out before any military forces had mobilized in any significant fashion. No one was sure if the launching of the nuclear weapons was intentional or accidental, but as soon as one country fired, the others quickly followed suit. Earth's rich and powerful, the 1% of the 1%, stared in silence as their home was ripped apart. The high-altitude jet carrying them steadily descended back down to Earth in the direction of the Antarctic. 500 people in total, chosen as the successors of the human race, shuffled off the jet and through the frozen outpost. An alarm blared, wrenching all of them out of their shell-shocked silence. A second later, the station shook violently. They had been found. There was no time left. They needed to leave right now. The swarm of people stampeded through the outpost, throwing one another out of the way in a desperate attempt to save their own lives, to save the lives of the human race. In front of them, the portal stood open. The green pastures, beautiful trees, it all felt so offensive as the earth behind them was engulfed in war. All those countless beautiful spaces were torn apart and left to waste, but they couldn't think about it now. They had to make it through. The handful of the survivors of the human race ran through the open portal 
just as an explosion ripped apart the remaining outpost. SCP-001-Yellow refers to a base of operation used for a Foundation Continuance Protocol, specifically Project Yellow. In the event of a world-destroying catastrophe where humanity appears irrevocably doomed, there is one bastion of hope. Referred to as the Garden of Eden by some of the crew, Yellow contains a large circular central space complete with lush green grass and an orchard measuring 500 by 500 meters. This open space constitutes the main living area of Project Yellow. Surrounding this space are tall, sheer cliffs, too vertical to be climbed unaided. Built into these cliffs are 500 sleeper chambers in which those evacuated from planet Earth will be suspended in cryosleep until a time when Earth is fit to be repopulated or a new home has been discovered. How can the Foundation guarantee that this safe haven avoids the calamities that could befall planet Earth? By housing Project Yellow in a separate dimension, a pocket dimension to be specific. Following the successes of Project Bifrost, in which SCP-2591-Omega's ability to access fictional pocket dimensions was utilized, the Foundation was able to establish a relatively stable and reliable dimension for Yellow to occupy. The only way to access the base of operations was via a dimensional rift or portal housed deep in the Antarctic. Now, of course, if Yellow's population consisted of 500 people in cryosleep, cut off from planet Earth, there would be no one capable of conducting maintenance or assessing the possibility of returning to planet Earth. Therefore, carved into the cliffs alongside the sleeper cells were living quarters for the crew of 60 specialists. It was this workforce who sat down together on the night of the apocalypse and raised a toast in a more bittersweet celebration. All 500 of the evacuees had managed to make it safely through the portal before its collapse. Each of them had been welcomed to Project Yellow and shown to their individual sleeper pods before being entered into cryosleep for the foreseeable future. But as each of the crew members raised their glasses into the air, Dr. Katrina Keyes couldn't help but feel uneasy about the proceedings. Working in this job, you'd have to have a dark sense of humor and an ability to move past things that could destroy the mental well-being of your average person. Even then, she struggled to come to terms with the near destruction of the human race. For her and the rest of the crew, life would look nothing like it did before they arrived here. It was vital for the integrity of the project that the crew remained consistent and effective in their work indefinitely. As a result, Yellow had been set up with perpetuity in mind. Every 55 years, she and all of her crewmates would pass on their knowledge, memories, and entire sense of being into a genetic clone. They would then die, allowing their clone to take over the responsibility of those tasks. In another 55 years, this would repeat again and again and again. All this time, it is the crew's responsibility to monitor the status of Earth through the use of 100 drones. Once the Earth is deemed safe, all 500 sleepers may be awoken and briefed on the current situation. If all 500 unanimously vote that returning to Earth is safe, they will do so. Otherwise, they will return to cryosleep, and the process will continue. It was little wonder that Dr. Keyes was unable to raise a glass with her colleagues at the prospect of being stuck here, cloned indefinitely for generations. She sat in silence as they raised their glasses and then emptied them. A couple of them coughed and sputtered. Their drinks must have gone down the wrong way, but then more coughs filled the room, along with choking sounds. Much to Dr. Keyes' horror, within less than a minute, she found herself alone, surrounded by the 59 corpses of her crewmates. In order for Project Yellow to be viable indefinitely, it was paramount that they find a solution for natural wear and tear. Through generation after generation of usage, essential items such as tools, computer systems, and even articles of clothing would eventually wear away and fall into disrepair. As such, Project Yellow was set up as a selective entropy zone in which inorganic matter would not degrade over time. Achieving such a zone was naturally an incredibly difficult undertaking. Project Bifrost underwent countless iterations as the team strived to create a stable and balanced fictional pocket dimension capable of sustaining human life long term. Over the next few days after the death of her crewmates, Dr. Katrina Keyes read through as much as she could about Project Bifrost. In the notes, she found records of dimensions where lava rained from the sky and the grass was radioactive. Yellow had been the first dimension without any glaringly obvious hazards for human life. But naturally, their work had quirks. 
One key quirk was that the chemical composition of cyanide and their drinks had been switched with one another. The only crew member not to raise a toast had been the only crew member not to drink a glass full of poison. Months went by, leaving Dr. Keyes alone to assess her situation. The drones, strategically positioned all around Earth to monitor its safety levels, had been systematically destroyed by the weasels. Only one feed remained, a security camera on the other side of the portal and the Antarctic outpost. There was virtually no intel to go off of, no way of knowing what the status of planet Earth was aside from the fact that this one burnt-out shell of a room still existed. Some days, Keyes would stare at the screen for hours, forgetting to go to bed. On others, she would walk through the orchard, trying her best to pretend that nothing outside of this 500 by 500 meter space existed. In a way, it didn't. The orchard of yellow did not consist of your usual apple trees. Instead, suspended from branches were essential supplies that the crew would need while manning and maintaining this base of operations. Some trees grew antibiotic drugs, others long strands of linen capable of being fashioned into clothing. Dr. Keyes' favorite tree was the one that grew rolls of toilet paper and tubes of toothpaste. It almost reminded her of a Halloween prank. Dr. Keyes' mental state steadily deteriorated as year after year she walked through the same orchard alone. Never before in history had one human being had so much control over the fate of the human race. At any moment, Dr. Keyes could have inputted a few simple commands into the computers and killed off all 500 of the remaining human beings in existence. The decision not to, to hold on to hope that one day humanity will be able to start again, was the only thing that kept her going day after lonely day. Only that and the other thing, the prospect of having to prepare for her clone to take over. While constructing the cloning pods, the crew had made a number of small errors the most glaring of which was that the fact that while all of the genetic material would be transferred from one person to their clone offspring, the mind would not. In other words, the clone that would replace her in this facility in 55 years' time would be starting out from scratch as a regular newborn baby. No memories, no advanced cognition. So Dr. Keyes went about preparing for the next of kin. She herself would die in the cloning process meaning that she would need to come up with a way of raising a child to be capable of running the whole facility from beyond the grave. Item 1 on her to-do list, create a god that her offspring would forever be in service to. With a sardonic smile, Dr. Keyes came up with an appropriately amusing name, Tracy the Sparkling. Seventy years later, Yellow was still operated by just a single crewmate, only now this crewmate was a 15-year-old girl. Nicknaming herself KK2, she went about all of her daily tasks with infectious excitement. The idea that she alone was responsible for the fate of the human race could not make her happier, and she was determined not to screw it up, both for her sake and to not anger her god, Tracy the Sparkling, whom she worshipped every evening before bed. Whenever a problem would come up, she would go and visit KK1, where she knew she would be met with sound advice. Pushing open the door to the crew quarters, KK2 would find the corpse lying on the floor in its usual place as a number of pre-recorded messages would bark at her. Lesson NE957, why taking a bath is important, even if no one but you will ever know how you smell. All she had to do was not anger the disciplinary drones with their harsh tasers and do her duty until it was time for KK3 to take over. At that point, she would be welcomed into the afterlife with all of the other KKs, a wonderful and magical place known simply as Burger King. That was until KK2 got far enough through the audio recordings of her predecessor to discover that Tracy the Sparkling was entirely made up and her life meant nothing. It was just a stepping stone for another clone, for another clone, for another clone, until eventually the Earth would be okay. By KK-52, the remaining camera on Earth, the one housed in the Antarctic outpost, went offline. While inorganic material within yellow compound would not undergo aging, the same could not be said of the circuitry left on Earth. Generation after generation of KK lived and died, each one growing more spiteful towards the one that came before them. Each one did their best to undermine the one that would come after them. The lore around Tracy the Sparkling expanded further and further with each generation. There would be waves of highly religious KKs, followed by waves of devoutly atheistic ones, 
as each sought to rebel against their pseudo-parents. KK-89 was the first to expand the religious movement to include the teaspoons. Very methodically, she went through each teaspoon in the canteen and named it after a different animal from Earth. Before long, subsequent KKs established a shrine to the teaspoons. The living space of Project Yellow steadily descended into madness, with writings all over the walls, bizarre decorations, and rituals long forgotten until a new KK came along and invented something to take their place. KK-216 lived her entire life in silence, never once recording an audio log or even talking to herself. She lived and died walking through the garden in silence, wrapped up in linens. KK-310 did the opposite. She fancied herself a music composer and scrawled the lyrics to haunting symphonies about nuclear apocalypse, eternal isolation, and the prospect of the angel of death coming to rescue her across all of the walls. No matter how hard any of the KKs tried, however, none of them were able to hack into the cloning machine. Generation after generation of Dr. Keys lived and died, desperate to know what a friend was, to have someone else to talk to. But despite all of their best efforts, they were unable to tamper with the cloning machine to get it to spit out another person. For several hundred years, the KKs gave up entirely. That was, until KK-507 came along. Day after day, she sat at the cloning machine, desperately typing away at it, trying her best to figure out how the computer coding worked. The downside of living in a pocket universe was that none of the computer circuitry behaved the way it would on Earth. She was certain that she'd made progress. Any generation now, they were going to have a breakthrough and be able to make a friend, when all of a sudden, a totally alien noise filled the containment space, a sound that hadn't been heard for millennia. Alert! Door controls overridden. Opening. KK-507 turned around in horror to see that the portal, the entrance to their world from Earth, had been opened. The figure of a man. No, not a man. A robot, painted to almost look like a crash test dummy, stepped out into the orchard. Hello! The goddess has informed us that this is the last bastion of the true human race. Is that correct? KK-507 opened her mouth and screamed. Throwing indestructible lizards into vats of acid. Hunting strange chicken men through forests in Ireland. Arguing in Latin with a man wearing a haunted Roman centurion's helmet. When you join the SCP Foundation, you might be expecting high-octane drama all of the time. Especially with the name Street Sweepers. You'd expect this mobile task force to be neck deep in some real action-packed street racing. Maybe you wouldn't think that they'd be tasked with driving all day every day in four-hour shifts tailing a semi-truck all over Birmingham, Alabama. But as Agent Moore and his colleague pulled into the lay-by behind the truck, neither of them were ready for what they were about to witness. SCP-2590 was first discovered by the Foundation at a routine traffic stop. Investigating a totally different anomaly in the Birmingham area, Agents Peters and Smith had been posing as local police officers. The Foundation had been trying to track down an artifact that was supposedly being smuggled across the U.S. in the back of a nondescript station wagon. Peters and Smith had been allocated a pair of beat-up old police cruisers, which they'd parked across the dirt road, fully blocking any traffic from coming through. It was several hours into their shift when the incident occurred, just at the point they were starting to lose focus. Taking a look through the suitcases and memorabilia from a family's trip to Disney World, Peters had taken way too long to hear the noise of the engine swelling behind him. He spun around to see the hulking shape of the semi-truck barreling straight towards him, Agent Smith, and a family of five. With only two seconds to react, he yelled out at the top of his lungs and dived out of the way, leaving the trunk of the car wide open with five screams emerging from inside. Smith, who had been sitting in one of the cruisers, only just managed to get out before the semi made contact. Eyes closed, Agent Peters waited for the inevitable sound of screaming rubber, the bang of metal on metal, and the shower of glass on asphalt, but it never came. When he opened his eyes, the station wagon was still parked up in front of them, the two police cruisers still blocking the road and all of the Disney merch still piled high in the trunk. The semi was driving off along the road, on the other side of their blockade, with not a scratch on it. Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Smith, who had kept his eyes open and witnessed the whole thing, leapt into action. He ordered his partner, still lying confused in the dirt, to administer Class A amnestics to the family and call in for backup. Agent Smith himself jammed his keys into the ignition, 
twisting them so hard he almost bent the metal, and took off after the vehicle. What Agents Smith and Peters had just witnessed was the very first Foundation exposure to SCP-2590, fondly nicknamed Trailer Trash. As Smith pulled up alongside the vehicle and studied it for the first time, he made a note of its initial appearance over the radio, an appearance which remains unchanged years later. The badges on the vehicle claim that it is an international ProStar Day Cab semi-trailer truck, complete with an unmarked trailer. As the agent flicked on his lights and indicated that the vehicle should pull over, he noted that it didn't have any license plates on it, either front or rear. He leaned forward in his seat, trying to peer into the cab to make out the driver, but in the Alabama sun, the man just looked like a shadowy figure. They drove side by side along the road for almost a mile. The truck made no signs of pulling over despite Agent Smith's continued insistence and repeated flashes of the cop lights, but it also didn't attempt to pull away either. It just continued to drive a few miles per hour below the speed limit. The driver didn't seem to look across at him once. Having discussed it with Foundation staff, they decided it was best not to draw attention to the situation. They had no idea whether this SCP was hostile or posed any threat to civilian life, but having blue and red lights flashing at it appeared to be doing little to change the situation. Instead, he switched off the sirens and pulled in behind the truck, tailing it around Birmingham as the Foundation readied further agents to respond to the situation. For almost an hour, nothing of note happened. Agent Smith drove behind the trailer, watching it like a hawk. He observed that it obeyed every traffic law to a T. It never broke the speed limit, never cut anyone off, and left room for other vehicles to merge. If it hadn't seen it drive straight through a roadblock as if it wasn't there, he would have never suspected a thing. But then the truck turned its turn signal on. They had just come off the highway and merged onto a quiet side street, just as the sun was starting to hang low in the sky. The truck crept across the side of the road, squeezing its brakes gently, and stopped. Agent Smith matched the action the whole way, pulling up about 20 feet behind the trailer. In constant radio communication, he kicked open his door and stepped out into the evening air. Foundation personnel advised that he keep his hand on his gun at all times and approach with caution. He didn't really need them to tell him that. Smith called for the driver to step out of the cab. No response. The truck just sat there with its hazards on engine off. After a moment, there was a clunk, and the trailer door started to slowly open, all by itself. Agent Smith called in backup, but they were still several minutes out. Instead, he ran back to the car, gun raised, and waited to see what was inside as the door slowly opened to reveal nothing. No, not quite nothing. There was something small on the floor of the trailer, right in the center as if it hadn't been moved around at all by the vehicle's motion. It was red a kind of elongated cuboid. He reported it all to the Foundation over his radio, then paused when he recognized what it was. A Kit Kat candy bar, or to be more specific, a Kit Kat Chunky. What happened after this point was hazy. Agent Smith was found on the roadside just 20 minutes later, confused about what had happened. The truck was nowhere in sight. However, a security camera from a convenience store just up the street happened to capture the interaction. In the footage, you see Agent Smith approaching the trailer with his gun raised, looking at the Kit Kat. He tries to enter the trailer, but is unable to, so he approaches the driver's side door. While talking to the shadowy figure in the cab, he drops his gun and stands motionless, a confused and sleepy expression on his face, until the trailer door closes and the SCP drives away. Contact was re-established with SCP-2590 soon after, and has been maintained almost uninterrupted ever since. The findings made on that initial encounter seem to hold true across further examination. Personnel have reached out to Navistar International, the company that supposedly manufactures this model of semi-truck, but there appears to be no records of its creation or shipment to the US. In fact, no documentation at all can be attributed to the truck or any components on it. The driver in the front cab is a humanoid figure who is perpetually shrouded in shadow, designated SCP-2590-1. Attempts to reveal the driver's figures have proved ineffective, as even powerful spotlights do not shed enough light into the cab to render the driver visible. 
Quite what this driver's role is in the operation of SCP-2590 is unknown. SCP-2590-1 appears to have some proximity-based amnestic qualities, as anyone approaching it on foot has reported memory loss and confusion soon after, just like Agent Smith. As also discovered by the two agents and their roadblock, containment of this SCP is simply not possible. While the majority of the time the SCP is corporeal, it possesses the ability to pass through solid objects at will. All attempted roadblocks have resulted in the same thing happening. The SCP will just phase right through on them as if nothing was there. Since it cannot be contained in the usual way, a different operation has been set up to monitor the truck's activities, which so far have proven to be apparently harmless to the civilian population. Mobile Task Force Gamma-133, also known as the Street Sweepers, has been established to follow this SCP around Birmingham at all times. They operate in four-hour shifts, with two agents in unmarked vehicles sticking close behind the trailer at all times. The Foundation was able to fit a tracking device onto it as well, providing researchers with continuous location data for where they can find the vehicle. At seemingly random times, supposedly determined by the SCP itself, it pulls over somewhere quiet and opens the door to its trailer. The door will remain open for 60 seconds and then close again. Any attempts to enter the trailer have been blocked by some kind of invisible barrier, seemingly impenetrable to most approaches. More violent and destructive methods of entry cannot be authorized for testing due to the heavy civilian population in the surrounding area. Every time the doors open, there is something different in the trailer. Researchers are trying to ascertain some kind of pattern or messaging behind most of the objects, but many seem to be random. The current list of things that have appeared in the back of SCP-2590 include an iPhone 3G, a red apple, and a lit light bulb without any visible form of power supply. Most notable about the objects in the trailer is that often they appear to be human beings, as happened on the night that Agent Moore was on duty in the Street Sweepers. The agents pulled in behind the truck as per usual when it slowed to a stop beside the highway. Agent Moore got out of the vehicle second, unenthused about the monotony of the task he had been assigned. Expecting to see a cardboard box or a chapstick when the trailer door opened, he was left shocked when he came face to face with himself. Few people can say they have seen themselves in real life. Most of them have been administered with various anesthetics to make them forget, but Agent Moore went on to report how bizarre of an experience it was. He claimed that it was utterly unlike looking in a mirror where your reflection is flipped and follows your every move. Seeing yourself standing in three dimensions, moving independently and evidently in a great deal of distress is an experience that few would envy. Any time a human being materializes in the trailer, they appear to be in a great deal of distress as they attempt to escape through the invisible barrier. Agent Moore and his partner Agent Hall could do nothing but stand and watch in confusion as the copy of him attempted to free himself before. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the vehicle pulled away again. Several instances have occurred of duplicate humans appearing in the trailer, but each time the original person seems to have had no knowledge of this taking place and nothing out of the ordinary happens to them. However, there appears to be some small pattern demonstrating the SCP as an awareness of the Foundation, as it has also duplicated Agent Inglis's sister, who has no connection to this SCP at all. Incident 16 was the most distressing of all, as a large slab of metal appeared in the back of the trailer with the SCP Foundation logo painted across it. Agent Inglis and Schultz were on duty at this time and observed copious amounts of blood flowing out of the metal slab. Before long, the blood filled the back of the trailer, pushing up against the invisible barrier. All of a sudden, 52 seconds into the encounter, the barrier vanished, and a cascade of blood with the slab inside were launched out at the two agents at a speed of over 190 kilometers an hour, killing them both instantly. Since this incident, SCP-2590 has been treated with greater caution. The most mysterious thing to have come from researching this truck came on December 4, 2011, when, for the first time, the truck's tracking beacon stopped working. It had been seen pulling into an abandoned warehouse, and so a team of street sweepers was immediately dispatched to investigate. When they arrived, they found the vehicle moving through the warehouse at a slow crawl. Choosing to pursue on foot and leave a pair of agents at the entrance, they followed the SCP through the facility 
until it came to what agents described as a service tunnel or sewer of some sort. Putting headlamps on, they followed the truck down into the tunnel, maintaining radio contact throughout. As they reported the direction they were traveling and the distance, it quickly became apparent to Foundation personnel that this was no ordinary tunnel. The warehouse was positioned overlooking a cliff, and so the geography was not physically possible. As the street sweepers descended further into the tunnel, they noted there was increased levels of carbon monoxide. Radio contacts started to dip in and out, losing signal as they went further downhill. Just at the edge of their signal with the foundation, the truck stopped and opened its trailer door. Inside was just a single piece of parchment with the words, I'm just delivering a message written on it. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the truck continued. After they had passed the kilometer mark, the radio signal worsened quickly and after a couple of scrambled messages, the team down there were not heard from again. The channel stayed open for another six hours before the Foundation made the decision to announce the agents missing in action. In March 2015, over three years later, a radio signal came into contact with the Foundation again from Birmingham, Alabama. It was from the headset of the squad leader who had gone into the tunnel. Initially confused as to who had gained access to the comms channel, the Foundation demanded that the agent state his full name and rank. The agent, himself confused, obliged, questioning why they were so suspicious. He and his team claimed to have only lost contact for about 15 minutes. They had followed the FCP a little further until carbon monoxide levels had risen too high to continue, at which point they had watched the truck disappearing into the distance as they walked back to the surface. All agents have undergone extensive psychological rehabilitation to settle them back into society, as well as classes to fill them in on things like the London Olympics, the Ice Bucket Challenge, and Gangnam Style. As for SCP-2590, it is back out on the roads, roaming around Birmingham, Alabama continuously, never stopping for fuel, always obeying the rules of the road, occasionally opening its trailer doors to reveal new and bizarre findings. When it comes to beings with fearsome reputations, there are few SCPs that are as widely dreaded as the hard-to-destroy reptile, SCP-682. No sane mortal would ever choose to face such a creature, and its overwhelming ferocity and strength have even given the reincarnating warrior SCP-076-2 able pause on more than one occasion. But then again, the sane aren't exactly in high demand at the SCP Foundation or at equivalent organizations formed for the purpose of battling anomalous and supernatural entities. Organizations such as the Public Safety Devil Hunters from the popular manga and anime Chainsaw Man count numerous peculiar individuals among their ranks. And sometimes the best of the best are marked by a distinctive tendency for out-of-the-box thinking. That's putting it politely, at least. But this isn't the story of some aberrant loser freakazoid. No, definitely not. The heroine of this tale is none other than the mightiest and most charismatic future Nobel Prize winner ever to grace the rest of us shameful worms with her presence. The invincible and dearly beloved blood fiend, Power. Who just so happens to be the undisputed best character in Chainsaw Man and of all fiction as well. It appeared to be an unusually boring day at public safety, and for this, Kobeni was grateful. The young woman had come to expect the absolute worst from her job as a devil hunter, as her assignments usually entailed facing down hellish entities born from the very fears of the human race. While one would think that someone who worked so diligently in the field would have grown numb to it all, Kobeni still very much retained her anxieties, both on and off the job. At least all she had to do today was file paperwork from one of the public safety's like-minded partners in supernatural management, the SCP Foundation. It was a safe and harmless task, aside from the risk of paper cuts and the associated potential for the paper cut devil to show up. Even so, Kobeni would do her best to make this rare moment of peace last as long as possible. A voice cried from down the hallway. Oh no, not her, Kobeni thought. Why is she even at work today? She's a fighter for Division 4 and she's not good at anything else. Loud, exaggerated footsteps rang out through the hallway as the blood fiends stomped through the offices of public safety. Kobeni wanted to shrink until she vanished from sight or let herself sink into the floor. Her desire to not have to see power today was so great that she contemplated opening a window and climbing down the side of the building to the ground floor. 
please don't come this way. Kobeni was still carrying a heavy stack of freshly filed paperwork, and she didn't want her tireless efforts at organization to go to waste. She looked frantically at the cabinets in the storage room she was in, hoping to find enough space for her to crawl into and make herself scarce. But it was too late. Power slammed open the door of the storage room and announced her presence. The shock was so great that Kobeni screamed and flung the stack of SCP Foundation papers all over the ground. She clutched her fast-beating heart, unable to attend to the mess immediately. Kobeni hadn't had to experience a fright that sudden since the time that she was sent to hunt the jump scare devil. The poor girl could never have a surprise party thrown in her honor again. True to her name, Power immediately reprimanded Kobeni for dropping the papers, stating that her workmanship was sloppy and that Power herself could easily carry ten times the amount of paper. Kobeni tried to not let the chiding of her co-worker affect her mood. She bent down and scooped up the papers, but much to her chagrin, Power decided to help with this task as well. The Blood Fiend began grabbing the papers and stacking them as assertively as possible on the nearest surfaces, resulting in many crumpled edges and uneven piles. Kobeni attempted, albeit hesitantly, to correct Power's paper collection method, only to be met with more scorn. Kobeni nearly cried. This was just too much for her to handle, especially on what was supposed to be a calm day. That was when Power picked up one of the files and began to read. It was a record of the infamous cross-test between SCP-682 and SCP-076-2. Since Public Safety had previously assisted the Foundation in recontaining SCP-076-2, there had been an agreement to send copies of all relevant documents involving Abel over to Japan in case of another incident. As Power struggled through the scientific language and specifics, she began to envision her own version of the events that played out on the page. She imagined herself as Abel, facing off in pitched combat against SCP-682 and giving the terrible lizard a run for its money in the process. In the mere seconds it took for Power to finish reading the document, she had not only concocted an entire epic battle in mind, but was not fully convinced that her fantasy was indistinguishable from one of her own lived experiences. In her head, Power had definitely fought against SCP-682, and she'd do it again in a heartbeat, just to teach that overgrown reptile another lesson. Power asked Kobeni if she had ever told her about the time that the Blood Fiend had totally defeated SCP-682. Kobeni, still clutching to her increasingly frail understanding of reality, responded with confusion. What was she talking about? Nobody in public safety had fought against an SCP other than 076-2. There was no possible way that Power was telling the truth. But the scariest part was, Power herself didn't even know that she was lying. The Blood Fiend began to relate the sordid details of her pulse-pounding fight with SCP-682 to Kobeni in great detail. Kobeni, for her part, was too emotionally drained at this point to try and stop her. It all started at the bowling alley, where Power was hanging out with her much less intelligent friends, Aki and Denji. The Blood Fiend had just finished winning her fifth perfectly scored game in a row, when some shady characters a few lanes over decided to cause some trouble. The leader of this little gang was none other than SCP-682. The way you bowl is disgusting, the troublemaking lizard said. This wicked remark would not be stood for. Not in the proud bowling establishment that Power had founded with her own money and achieved several years of successful business running herself. The bowling alley was a pillar of the community and she was the owner. There would be no further disrespect on her watch. Power put up her dukes and got ready to bring the pain down on SCP-682. Aki and Denji were too terrified to help her out as usual, but did their best to cheer their leader on from the sidelines. SCP-682 also dismissed its minions and crawled forward like the big, ugly lizard that it was. It obviously didn't know better, which is why it wasn't backing down in the face of the greatest devil hunter that the world had ever known. Either way, this would be a brawl for the ages. Rather than cause damage to her beloved place of business, Power suggested that she and her opponent took this fight outside. Despite its uncouth demeanor, the reptile had a healthy appreciation for the fine sport of bowling, and most especially, this particularly excellent run five-star bowling alley. 
It agreed to step outside in the interest of not bringing bowling into this intensely personal grudge match. But then again, wasn't the fight about bowling? No matter. Power and SCP-682 walked outside the bowling alley into a vast, trackless wasteland, the perfect place for both of them to go all out without hurting any civilians. Using her ability to control and reshape her own blood, Power constructed an enormous crimson mallet that she was able to wield gracefully in both her hands despite its incredible size. SCP-682 readied itself. It had faced many different kinds of humanoid weapon wielders before, including Abel, but it was too clever of an adversary to let its guard down. Especially because, in this case, the blood fiend it was fighting was a remarkable businesswoman and an Olympic gold medalist in everything. The reptile certainly let its guard down. Power held the hammer above her head and jumped high into the air. If she wanted to, she could have circled the globe in a single leap, but out of respect for the fact that SCP-682 was a paying customer at her establishment, she decided to hold back for the first attack, at least. Nonetheless, she brought the hammer down on the hard-to-destroy reptile with supreme force. SCP-682 smashed into the ground with such a force that a crater opened up beneath its body. The reptile itself didn't seem especially damaged, but the effects on the surrounding environment were certainly dramatic and fitting for an ultimate showdown. SCP-682 shook off the blow and pounced on power with such ferocity that even she couldn't remain on her feet. She tumbled back into the dust and debris of the wasteland for several miles before catching herself and standing back up. Remarkably, there wasn't even a scratch on her. She pointed and laughed at SCP-682, mocking it for its weakness and stupidity. The reptile grinned wickedly and responded with a mocking laugh of its own. The creature had intentionally taken a hit from power in order to better understand her fighting moves. Who wouldn't want to steal those masterful techniques after all? They're just too good to resist making a cheap copy of, and from what Power could remember from her speed read of the file, that appeared to be SCP-682's whole thing. Soon, a barding of blood-red armor appeared around SCP-682's body. In the short time that it had been fighting Power, it had clearly learned how to manipulate its own blood and was now even stronger for it. <laughs> now I'm as strong as you. I can't lose. SCP-682 barked at power. She swung her mallet in a show of force. The two combatants, now both wielding the near-limitless powers of the Blood Fiend, charged at each other across the battlefield. This was not just a mere sparring match anymore. It was a fight for the fate of the entire world. Snapping back to reality, Power's retelling of the story had devolved into a series of random exclamations and sound effects. Kobeni was now finding the events incredibly hard to follow, but thankfully she had been able to use Power's highly distractible mannerisms to finish restacking the files from the Foundation. Not a minute too soon either, as both she and Power's boss, Makima, stepped into the storage room. Apparently, Makima was in the process of doing a headcount of all employees who had come into work today, as any normal and benevolent superior would. She had been looking for Kobeni and Power for some time now, and was surprised to find them here, of all places. Kobeni explained that she had been putting away the last of the SCP Foundation files, and would gladly accept whatever new post she was given. But Power wasn't done with her current SCP-682 fascination, and turned to Makima hoping to be encouraged to continue the story. Makima simply smiled and implied that if Power was so inclined to settle her score with a hard-to-destroy reptile, public safety could get in contact with the Foundation and have her on a flight to Site-19 by that evening. Power suddenly realized that she had come down with a terrible case of whatever crippling disease that would be a sufficient excuse for her to not do that. Makima nodded and encouraged her subordinates to return to work. The man sprinted through the hallways of Site-01 as fast as he could. Bullets whizzed over his shoulders as panic shouts went up all around him. The whole facility was bathed in red as security alarms deafened his ears. He had to move fast, had to get out of here before it was too late. A force smacked him in the back so hard that he fell onto his face, skidding across the vinyl floor. Planting both hands on the ground and trying to push himself back up, he felt his right shoulder blade creaking and bending against itself. He'd been shot enough times in his life to know what a bullet-shattered bone felt like. Trying his best to ignore the pain washing through his body, he kept running. More bullets hit him, in his torso, his shoulders, his arms, and his neck. One even caught the top of his skull, 
slicing a clear line through his hair, but he kept running. The doors were slowly closing in front of him as the Foundation personnel swarmed the hallways. All he had to do was make it to those doors, slide through the gap, and he'd be free. If only they could understand. If only all the agents, researchers, and the Overseer Council could make sense of what he was telling them, they would let him go through these doors instead of trying to shoot him down like a dog. Just ten feet to go, he was nearly there when a bullet ripped through his calf and sent him tumbling to the ground again. But this time, before he could get up, a rain of bullets washed through his body, igniting a pain so fierce that he wished it could all just be over. But it never was. The pile of pitiful remains was wheeled back into a containment cell with a door locked behind it. You would think the body lying on the floor was some kind of roadkill, but it was in fact a man. A man whose body slowly and painfully, over the course of four months, pushed every one of the 247 bullets out of itself and got to work stitching itself back together as he lay there weeping on his own. Andrea Twain had been headhunted by the Foundation while she was still in college. Sitting in a Harvard library, she'd been hard at work on her thesis, pouring hour after hour into researching jellyfish. She was starting to see them in her sleep, and she was falling asleep at her desk quite a lot. Fueled by energy drinks and cups of coffee, it was starting to seem like the jellyfish were floating all around her between the bookshelves. That's why, when she was approached by Foundation operatives, offering her a place studying the most top-secret entity on the planet, she was pretty sure it was all in her head. But then, six months later, and living in a facility that she didn't even know the location of, it started to dawn on her the gravity of the task she had been handed. Her research topic had been the Hydrosian Turritopsis dornai, a small jellyfish with the power to reverse the aging process, dubbed the Immortal Jellyfish. She had been right on the verge of cracking what was the creature's genetic makeup that made it able to produce cells younger than those that they were replacing, a feat that could cure all number of human diseases diseases and revolutionize medicine and society as we know it. But standing at the window in Site-01 and looking through the glass at SCP-001, Andrea realized that all of her research had barely scratched the surface of what was possible. On the other side of the window sat SCP-001. To many, this SCP was probably very disappointing to look at. It wasn't a giant reptile, it couldn't teleport around the facility, it didn't even have any visible powers, or really anything to distinguish it from any of the other researchers sitting on the other side of the glass. It looked entirely like a regular human male. It was housed in a standard humanoid containment cell with no added security features. It was sustained on a standard humanoid meal program, three square meals a day with the correct number of calories, nutrients, and vitamins. If anything, SCP-001 probably had a more balanced diet than Andrea herself did. Some researchers have questioned the need for feeding this SCP. It was immortal, totally unkillable, and resistant to aging. It had been burned alive, drowned in acid, and beaten to a pulp, and yet very slowly, it would always recover. So why did they feed it? If they didn't, it would get quite grumpy. More than anything in the world, Andrea was desperate to talk to it. Containment procedures were very strict around this SCP. There would be no contact beyond the delivery of meals, no conversations, no sign language, nothing. It would sit by itself alone in silence. And three times a day, a meal would be placed in front of it by a researcher who would promptly leave. The reason? SCP-001 could predict the future. Initial research into this SCP found that it had an uncanny ability to describe events that had not yet occurred, despite having no exposure to the outside world. It could predict an entire season of Major League Baseball, right down to the individual player performances. It foretold the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Chernobyl meltdown, 9-11, the crash of the housing market, and countless other events. In 2004, a careless researcher asked SCP-001 what the weather was looking like. SCP-001 proceeded in detail to describe Hurricane Katrina. From its formation through to the humanitarian response and the political fallout, a full year before any of those events unfolded. The Foundation has tried and failed to use these predictions in order to prevent tragedies from occurring, but due to ironic twists of fate, any attempts to prevent these predictions from coming true often wind up fulfilling them. 
In the case of Chernobyl, agents who were deployed into the Soviet Union to work in the power plant itself wound up making critical blunders that led to the reactor's meltdown. If the Foundation had not gotten involved, the accident would have been averted. That said, taking a passive approach does not appear to be an effective countermeasure either. It seems that whatever SCP-001 predicts, that course of history becomes inevitable. How could you not want to talk to such an entity? As Andrea stood at the glass watching it, she knew she had to hatch a plan. The Foundation may not be able to prevent these tragedies from occurring, but surely they would want to know what's going to happen. They were researchers after all, and their job was to discover information. Predicting the future? That was the most valuable information of all. But it went deeper than that. If anything, the predictions of the future were a byproduct in Andrea's mind. There was something suspicious going on with this SCP, something that the Foundation was trying its best to keep under wraps. She had seen it in the classified documents, files left out on desks that should have been locked away securely. Security and procedure had grown lax with the monotony of containing this SCP. In these files were interview snippets, a chance for this SCP to reveal who it truly was. At the start of the first interview, Dr. Lynch simply pleasantly greeted SCP-001. He replied, Your daughter will be hit by a bus before her seventh birthday. I can tell you the specific day if you'd like. The interview session was paused as Dr. Lynch grew distressed and had to leave his post to go and spend time with his family. The interview resumed under Dr. Goldstein, who asked SCP-001 why he felt the need to give such distressing information to Dr. Lynch. He replied, I have told you people countless times before, you are not to refer to me as SCP-001. I am the founder of this organization and you will address me as such. When Dr. Goldstein questioned that assertion, SCP-001 replied, You really don't believe everything they have on file, do you? Address me as founder or I will tell you about what your husband is up to, Dr. Goldstein. Things collapsed very quickly after that. Andrea's plan started, as so many great plans do, with her sprinkling a chemical compound over one of her colleagues' Cheerios. It was nothing poisonous, well, at least not that poisonous, but it would put him out of action for a few months, long enough for her to assume his position. Andrea had been next in line for a while to take over the role of meal deliveries for SCP-001, and as her fellow researcher violently vomited into a bucket in the corner of their office, she knew that her time had come. With the plastic tray in her hands, loaded with some kind of beige slop and an apple, she waited in the doorway, ready for the seals to hiss and the door to slide slowly open for her. She stepped into the room, trembling. She had expected the air in here to be stale, breathed and rebreathed for decades by the same man, but of course it had been expertly filtered and purified by the Foundation systems. The air in here was as clean and balanced as it had been on the other side of the glass. The founder looked up at her as she walked towards him. She would be a new face to him, something he hadn't seen for the prior five years. His eyes dug into her, showing no surprise at all. She suddenly realized that, of course, he wouldn't be shocked to see someone new. He could see the future. He knew that she was coming. Suddenly unsure of herself, she wondered what else he knew about her future about her most closely guarded secrets, about whether her plan would work at all. Andrea placed the meal in front of him silently, knowing that the cameras and microphones were all paying close attention to her. Subtly as she could, she nodded at SCP-001, turned around, and left the room. Andrea's heart hammered as she sat back down on the other side of the glass with her colleagues. Her entire plan hinged on one thing, monotony. All of the checks, all of the vigilance, all the scrutiny that had been poured into SCP-001 for decades had to have faded by now. Faded just enough for the person watching the security cameras not to notice one word etched into the plastic tray as SCP-001 took its spoonful of food. Now! SCP-001 launched from its chair and sprinted towards the door in the corner of the room. Before any of the other researchers could react, Andreas slammed a hand on the open door button. There was a hissing sound, and the SCP was free from its containment cell. Confused voices filled the room, yelling over one another in utter confusion. They had all been so caught off guard that none of them had paid attention to what had just happened. Before they had time to put the pieces together, Andrea was out of the door herself, running down the corridor. There was just one door between her and the SCP. She ran over to key in the security code to open the door and let the SCP out. 
but before she could even touch the keypad, a bullet caught her in the chest, and she collapsed to the ground, wheezing. A scared security agent stared at her wide-eyed. What have you done? He exclaimed. Then, both of them turned to look at the locked door, waiting. Andrea Twain had not wanted to let the SCP out until she saw one specific line from an interview tape. SCP-001, referring to itself as the Founder, explained in patient detail how it was entirely supportive of the Foundation's goals, motivations, and actions. It had no intention of intervening with any of their work. It explained that all of their ideas were, in fact, its own, as it was the one who had created the Foundation in the first place. But there was something coming. A prediction that SCP-001 refused to speak out loud under any circumstances. It had just one request that it would repeat to every interviewer for decades after Whoa. decade. They had to free it, so it could prevent that event from happening. It must be allowed to construct a device, otherwise. Well, it actually never explains that part. Neither does it explain what this device is and Point Blank refuses to allow another to build this device in its stead. Due to the unpredictability of what would happen if SCP-001 was allowed to construct this device, the Overseer Council has Point Blank refused to entertain the notion, but Andrea just couldn't shake it from her mind. This SCP was capable of accurately and precisely predicting all number of future events right down to the granular details, no matter how tragic and how dark. Yet there was an unknown in its future. It didn't know whether it would be released or not. It had to beg for its freedom. Whatever it needed this device to defeat was clearly so powerful that it went beyond SCP-001's capacity to predict and understand it. There was an event coming that was so significant that it created chaos and uncertainty in SCP-001's perfect view of the future, and there was only one entity that Andrea trusted to be powerful enough to counteract this event. And as she lay there dying in a pool of her own blood, she looked up through the glass window in the door at the entity she trusted and watched as it keyed in the passcode to the door. The door slid open, and the SCP took off running along the hallway. With her dying breaths, Andrea told the SCP the passcode to the door that it had just opened, understanding the brilliance of what had just happened. The SCP had been able to open that door because it had seen the future where she told it the password. And with that, she smiled and laid her head down on the hard floor. Except SCP-001 did not manage to escape. It was gunned down in the hallway with 247 bullets that brutalized its body and was wheeled back into its containment cell, where it began the slow process of healing. For most of the research team, things went back to business as usual, albeit with slightly better security. But to the handful of researchers who really thought about what had happened, a sense of unease settled on their shoulders. SCP-001 would have known before it ran out of that cell and attempted Andrea's plan that its escape was going to fail. It would have known decades prior to the exact positions of the 247 bullets that pounded into its body. It would have known the searing agony that it would have to endure for months as its body slowly healed from its failed escape attempt. And yet, it had gone through with it anyway. What set of events had been put into motion when Andrea carved those three letters into the plastic tray? What greater purpose was SCP-001 working towards? And was it now too late to stop it? If you have ever taken a trip to Sun Top Mountain in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, Washington State, then you may have come across an old wooden structure, the Sun Top Fire Lookout. Built in the early 1930s, the building was used by the U.S. Forest Service to keep watch for any fires in the nearby woodland. At one point, Sun Top Fire Lookout would have been manned 365 days a year, complete with a bed for staff who were stationed there on rotation. The single-story lookout house overlooks the scenic valleys of the White River and Huckleberry Creek, but you're not here for an informative tourist guide. You probably don't care about the frankly fascinating history of the lookout and how it was used as part of the aircraft warning service during World War II, watching for enemy planes. No, you're here because something much darker lurks inside the Suntop Fire Lookout. 
and even though it appears to be a simple one-story tall wooden structure, it certainly is not short on space. SCP-3333 refers to an anomaly that the Foundation discovered inside the Suntop Fire Lookout House. The building's interior is a single square room measuring 14 feet by 14 feet, with large windows on all four sides. When standing inside Suntop Fire Lookout, looking up at the wooden ceiling, one will immediately notice a trap door. No big deal, right? A lot of places have a ceiling entrance to a small crawl space. There's probably nothing behind that trap door, apart from a dusty old attic. There's a latch that maybe once had a padlock there, but not anymore. Opening the trap door will reveal a collapsible ladder. Should anyone be brave or indeed foolish enough to begin to climb, then they'll soon find themselves right back where they started, inside Suntop Fire Lookout. Or so it will seem. The thing about being in a place like the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest that surrounds Suntop Fire Lookout is that woodland areas are teeming with life. Not just plants and trees, but birds and other animals of the forest. You can never truly be alone in a setting like that. There is always life everywhere around you. So when you ascend the ladder and climb right back into the Sun Top Fire Lookout, that is the first most noticeable difference you will find. It may take a while at first, but the nagging absence of something unusually so abundant in a forest will eventually become obvious. It's quiet, far too quiet. No birdsong or the sound of distant calls from woodland critters, just silence all around. Anyone ascending the ladder will find themselves in a copy of Suntop Fire Lookout's interior, one story higher than the ground level of the small wooden building, with the stairs leading up to the front door getting taller each time to reach up to the higher and higher building. Now you know the SCP Foundation and the types of bizarre interdimensional anomalies that they're used to dealing with. Perhaps SCP-3333 is a mirror dimension or a plane of existence where sound doesn't travel. It certainly seems to be identical to the Suntop Fire Lookout, save for the lack of any organic life outside. Of course, it's what you'll find living inside SCP-3333 that you may want to worry about. Climbing higher up the next ladder and through the next trapdoor every time with the same result. You appear at another copy of Suntop Fire Lookout, each one higher up than the last. What first seemed to be an innocuous, unassuming wooden building is now an endless ascension up into the heavens, towards the unknown in silence, without a shred of plant or animal life outside. As you climb, perhaps you start to think about how much higher these copies go. This might even be the biblical Jacob ladder connecting heaven and earth. That would be nice, wouldn't it? If you were gradually climbing your way up to paradise, it might make it worth the trip. But SCP-3333 is nothing that pleasant. You wouldn't be the first to attempt this long climb. When the SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-3333, a research detail set up an on-site base camp to examine this spatial anomaly. Their first exploration involved sending a member of D-Class personnel, designated D-4F-68A, up the ladder. His D number is a hexadecimal code that, when translated to text, reads O, so we'll call him that for brevity's sake. During the first day's exploration, O was able to climb 184 iterations of SCP-3333, communicating with head researcher Dr. Williams below. On the second day, O could see a pair of figures standing motionless on a nearby ridge, but the pair could not be seen by Dr. Williams and the other researchers at the base camp. Both figures disappeared shortly after O spotted them with the camera he had been issued, and he felt uneasy, almost certain that he saw them point at him. The next day, at the 345th copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout, O's behavior started to noticeably change. Previously, he had been anxious about the long climb and hadn't questioned directions given to him by Dr. Williams. Now he seemed to speak more casually, resisting instructions, asking Williams to climb back down and even calling her Doc instead of Doctor. O also reported seeing writing on the walls, but there was no evidence of this on his camera. It appeared that something had started to affect him. It was when O reached level 527 that things seemed to change more dramatically. Rather than SCP-3333 continuing upwards, 
The copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout no longer had a trap door or ladder. They seemed to be arranged side by side in a grid-like pattern. Stepping out of the main doorway, O remarked on the lack of sunlight and a walkway that connected directly to the front door of the next iteration of SCP-3333. O complained about the lack of natural light and again requested to be allowed back down. Dr. Williams instructed O to use the flashlights he was provided, but they wouldn't activate and their spare batteries had vanished. O then noticed a sudden movement, and just then his microphone and camera feed went dead, almost as if someone had turned them off. It appeared that SCP-3333 had something else lurking up there. Dr. Williams oversaw the second expedition into SCP-3333. This time, members of Mobile Task Force Mod Zero, also known by the codename Characteristic Egg in Spaces, were sent up the ladder. Their ascent through the various copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout were not as eventful as O's, with no signs of mysterious figures or anxious feelings that O seemed to feel as he climbed. When they reached level 527, where the copies of the lookout stopped progressing upwards and spread out in a pattern instead, their lights and equipment all seemed to be in working order. However, as the MTF team split up, one by one they encountered some sort of anomaly, or an effect of SCP-3333 that caused each of them to vanish into the dark. Either that, or something took them. These MTF units reappeared confused, and Mod 5, the team's leader, Graham Purcell, issued an order to retreat and the entire squad went back down the ladders for several days until they finally reached the base camp again. The members of Mod Zero were adamant they did not wish to climb SCP-3333 again, but Dr. Williams was beginning to understand more of the anomaly's effects. It appeared to cause abrupt changes to people's personalities, along with some sort of phenomenon that caused things to appear and disappear the higher one climbed. Assuming these were the result of a mimetic effect, Dr. Williams dispatched a counter-memetic specialist for the next expedition. This specialist was a blind, deaf, and mute woman known as Annette, or the Null Walker, who communicated via a signaling system embedded in her hand, but was otherwise immune to any mimetic influences. Observed by Dr. Williams and Graham Purcell at base camp, Annette made her way to the top of SCP-3333, reporting that she was aware of someone watching her from outside the copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout. On her body camera, a flicker of motion occurred, something looking through the windows that ducked out of frame when the camera passed in its direction. At the apex of SCP-3333, Annette kept her flashlight off, but reported that she could detect blood, following it to what she assumed was a body. Sounds of movement surrounded her, and as Annette switched on her flashlight, Williams and Purcell saw that it wasn't a body in front of her. Instead, it was a pile of rotting organs, decomposing muscles, and discarded bones. And among the pile was a metal dog tag that read, MTF Mod 5, Graham Purcell. The same man who was sitting next to Dr. Williams at base camp. Well, the same man on the outside, at least. The explanation for everything going on inside SCP-3333, all these strange occurrences and disappearances, finally came in a video sent from Dr. Williams' cell phone. In it, a panicked Williams, covered in blood, was fleeing from something at the top of the recursive stack of SCP-3333. There was no mimetic effect at the apex of the Sun Top Fire lookout copies. Nothing was causing the people that the Foundation sent up to act unlike themselves. They simply weren't themselves anymore. According to her frantic video, Dr. Williams had discovered the truth about what else was hiding within SCP-3333. With just the right amount of vagueness and intrigue, the research team had been drawn in. It was as if they'd been lured in by the lights of an anglerfish, realizing their grim fate only too late. The D-Class O, the MTF team, even Annette had been replaced. An unknown group of entities on the top level of SCP-3333 had been carefully observing them, waiting until they would not be seen to slip in and switch places. These entities had been creating imagined anomalous effects, like O seeing figures that weren't really there, as a way of luring more bodies further up the stack. They wanted the Foundation to keep sending expeditions into SCP-3333 
to keep them coming back. The mass of organs, musculature, and bones that Annette had stumbled across, revealing the ruse, had once belonged to Graham Purcell, before he was replaced. You see, the entities residing in SCP-3333 weren't just copying people. They weren't possessing them or mind-controlling them, or even shape-shifting to steal a person's likeness. They were taking skin. These creatures hollowed out Graham, O, Annette, and the MTF team, pulling out their innards and crawling their way inside, filling these fleshy puppets and leaving their internal organs to rot. These hollowed out people became vessels for the entities of SCP-3333 to hide in. The whole thing had been a trap, intentionally exploiting human weaknesses, intrigue, and unanswered questions. You know what they say about curiosity, and these entities used it to bring more potential vessels to the top of SCP-3333. They pretended to be the people who they had replaced, imitating them so the Foundation would send more personnel to explore the tower, increasing their supply of skins. Graham's dog tag had revealed the deception, and Dr. Williams had escaped up SCP-3333. The members of the research team that had already been replaced were hot on her tail, determined to catch and hollow her out too, and by the end of her video, they had succeeded. A month later though, a team delivering supplies realized what had happened and the trap door was sealed. Sun Top Fire Lookout was put under permanent guard, but at least 50 personnel were killed or replaced by one of the entities. A new mobile task force, Lambda-1 Maxwell's Demons, was created to hunt down and neutralize any of the entities that had escaped SCP-3333. But it's still unknown how many left the tower and are still out there somewhere waiting to use someone's curiosity about the strange and unknown against them. It had been getting slower. The longer the days, weeks, months, and years went on, the more time it took to move. Before, long before the collapse, it used to move like lightning. In the blink of a human eye, it could go from one side of a room to the other. It had moved with such speed that it looked to have disappeared from one place and reappeared in another. By the time the same human's eye reopened, there it would be, standing before them. And as they realized that they had to strain to keep their eyes open and stare at it, it would wait until they inevitably had to blink again. That was when it would strike. But now its movements were getting sluggish. It had been able to move around of its own volition for some time after the collapse, unobserved and thus free for the first time in a long while. Yet now it was succumbing to the one thing it couldn't move faster than, the one thing that makes dust of all things, time. A sound, suddenly and faintly, but undoubtedly caused by movement, a human, a victim. It turned to see the man enter the room, stopping still as his gaze fell over it. All it had to do was wait. The agent could barely believe his eyes. The second he'd spotted the sculpture, he'd instinctively frozen to the spot, rigid with sheer terror, heart drumming against his ribcage. Standing across the room from it, directly opposite, he kept himself as still as the concrete and rebar statue was. The agent knew that as long as he looked at it, it couldn't move. He just had to make sure he didn't so much as blink, or at least that's how it used to work. To his horror, the agent noticed that the arm of SCP-173 started to slowly reach towards him. But how? How had the sculpture, an anomaly once capable of moving only while unobserved, found a way to suddenly start reaching for this agent? Well, for a start, that has something to do with the particular Foundation operative who was looking at SCP-173, and technically wasn't at the same time. Let us start at the beginning. You see, some time ago, a former field agent working at the SCP Foundation suffered quite an unprecedented accident. Let's call him Daryl, a seemingly average man in his 30s, well as average as someone working for the Foundation can be. However, one mission would unexpectedly change Daryl's life forever, turning him into SCP-451. It started as a straightforward retrieval operation, Daryl was instructed to recover a dangerous anomalous artifact, 
However, he ultimately failed and was declared missing in action as a result. That is, until he miraculously resurfaced a month later at Site-19. But from Daryl's point of view, the entire Foundation facility looked like it had been deserted. Corridors and labs that had previously been bustling hives of activity were now unsettlingly empty. SCPs seemed to still be in their containment chambers, but without anyone watching or guarding them. As far as SCP-451 knew, he was the only man still alive on Earth. Some anomalous influence had left him with a unique affliction, a permanently altered perception. Daryl was rendered incapable of seeing other human beings. It wasn't just limited to his sight, either. He couldn't hear anyone or even perceive their existence. Any attempts the Foundation's researchers made to communicate with SCP-451 were unsuccessful. They could still see him, but it was like he was absent, standing just outside the real world. And yet to Daryl, it was somehow worse than that. Given the lack of people around him, being unable to see, hear, or interact with anyone, SCP-451 quickly adopted the belief that by interacting with the anomalous artifact, he had single-handedly wiped out the entire human race. While this wasn't true, he had no way of knowing that everyone else was still alive, he just couldn't perceive them. The guilt instilled in Daryl weighed heavily on the agent's conscience. He spent a lot of time wandering the corridors of Site-19, overwhelmed by his apparent isolation convinced he'd single-handedly caused the extinction of the human race. But what does SCP-451 have to do with SCP-173? How did Daryl go from being unable to see and hear other humans to staring down the sculpture? Well, while Daryl was suffering from his newly altered perception, something catastrophic was unfolding in the wider world he could hardly interact with anymore. An end-of-the-world scenario had taken place and left barely any survivors, making the perceived extinction of humanity by SCP-451 oddly prophetic. Something had caused the human race to actually die out, and with nobody around who could explain what had happened, the actual how and why were forgotten to history. And even if someone had managed to survive, SCP-451 would still be as oblivious to their explanations as he was to the disaster that claimed the lives of not only the whole SCP Foundation, but the rest of the world, too. Of course, without the Foundation and its personnel around any longer to safeguard the rest of humanity, or even anything left of humanity for them to protect, things quickly got even worse. The various contained SCPs soon found themselves free to run amok. Whatever had wiped the human race from existence left the world mostly uninhabited, and it didn't take long for some of the more aggressive anomalies to turn on each other. With no humans for them to prey on, they had to make do. But while they fought, killed, and died in the ruins of the world, one was left to roam freer than it had ever been. SCP-173 now that the sculpture was no longer caged by the Foundation, it could move around unobserved. Before, it would be frozen in place whenever personnel entered its cell to clean it every two weeks, constantly watching it to stop it from moving. But now, there were no personnel. After the human race had been wiped out, SCP-173 set about bursting free from its container. It took quite some time, using its heavy concrete and rebar arms to dent the walls from within continually pounding on the metal until it eventually gave way. Bursting free, SCP-173 found itself in a world with hardly anyone around to look at it, and that meant it could go anywhere it wanted, do anything it pleased, so long as none of the other surviving SCPs came across it. That did happen from time to time, of course. Any of the more humanoid anomalies that were capable of sight would sometimes stumble upon the sculpture, but they had to bling sometime, and when they did, SCP-173 would effortlessly zip over to where they stood and break their necks. Exercising its newfound freedom, SCP-173 moved unnoticed to the office of Dr. Alto Clef, the infamously unhinged Foundation researcher, weapons fanatic, and specialist in decommissioning SCPs. Clef, like the rest of the human race, was nowhere to be found when the sculpture burst into his office. If it had the capacity for emotions, maybe it felt angered, even cheated to find that Clef was gone. 
it had seemed to have come seeking revenge. For a number of years, Dr. Clef had been infatuated with SCP-173. Were he still alive, Clef himself would have described the anomalous statue as a former flame, someone he had a bond with. Although he had no idea how one-sided his feelings truly were, the sculpture, if it could feel, would have been indifferent towards the crazed researcher were it not for date night. Clef had, on a number of occasions, dressed as CP-173 in a black dress and a blonde wig and shared romantic evenings in its company. It's never been known if SCP-173 is just an object with anomalous movement properties or if the sculpture is an actual living creature with sentience. But if it was, then no doubt being made to go on repeated dates with Dr. Clef would have humiliated SCP-173. And as it searched Clef's office, while it couldn't find the loathsome researcher, it did find a certain black dress and wig that the sculpture quickly crushed under the weight of its heavy, stony arms. It wasn't Dr. Clef being smashed, but it was enough. Meanwhile, SCP-451 still remained completely unaware that everyone else was gone. To him, nothing had changed. He still couldn't perceive anyone, not that there was anyone around anyway. He'd witnessed a lot of destruction unfurled by the anomalous breaking their containment, but most didn't pay Daryl any mind. Ones that did quickly found they couldn't interact with him or cause the former Foundation agent harm and quickly lost interest in him. That was an added torturous part of SCP-451's condition. He couldn't die. A long time before the end of the world scenario, Daryl had found a firearm belonging to another member of Foundation personnel in the main break room of Site-19. As SCP-451 tried to fire the weapon, the bullet ricocheted off the wall and the gunshot passed directly through him. The same bullet mortally wounded another nearby member of Foundation staff, and it was after he'd accidentally injured this unsuspecting researcher that SCP-451 found he was briefly able to interact with them, right as the researcher's life was fading. That was the last time he'd been able to see anyone, well, any human anyway. But then, he encountered SCP-173. The pair of them came face to face with each other in the ruins of a Foundation site. By that point, the overwhelming loneliness of believing himself to be humanity's sole survivor had already taken a bad toll on Daryl. He was losing himself, every day getting more and more overwhelmed by the anomalous hell he was living. SCP-173 was caught for a moment when SCP-451 walked in on it, stuck fast like it had been whenever someone observed it. But as Daryl stared and tried not to blink, the sculpture found itself still able to move. It could see SCP-451 and he could see it, yet it could still move. Somehow due to the way Daryl's perception had been anomalously altered, it affected the way he saw the sculpture. It was almost like he was seeing it without seeing. It had been so long since humanity disappeared that the sculpture's movements had been gradually getting slower. The rebar holding it together had been rusting, creaking more as it bent and twisted. Its concrete parts were starting to crumble away. And now, despite being free, it was struggling just to reach an arm out to SCP-451 to kill him. For his part, SCP-451 had been forced to live out a painful existence, spending each and every day alone. As delirium had begun to sink its claws into him, Daryl had wished for one thing, some company, and now he'd found it. Misinterpreting SCP-173's arm extending towards him, SCP-451 broke down crying and embraced the sculpture. His tears ran down the anomalous statue's decaying concrete body, the struts in its arms creaking as it tried to reach for Daryl. But the sculpture was getting old, too old to kill as quick as it used to. Time and loneliness, two of the most painful things to experience the side effect of. And yet, while SCP-173 continued to wither, it was unknowingly helping alleviate someone else's pain. Although it could still move while SCP-451 looked at it, Daryl didn't leave the sculpture alone. In his mind driven half-mad by being isolated for so long, he genuinely believed that SCP-173 and he were friends. 
The sculpture had spared him after all. SCP-451 had no idea what had happened to the rest of the human race, and the other SCPs now loose on the world barely acknowledged him. But in the concrete and rebar statue, he found a friend. SCP-451 followed SCP-173 as it shuffled itself away, not leaving its side, matching the slowed speed of its stony, scraping movements. As they wandered together, Daryl poured his heart out about everything and anything, glad to have someone, anyone to talk to, even if the sculpture couldn't reply. Again, nobody knows for sure if SCP-173 was an object or a living creature, but if it was the latter, then there's still no telling how it perceived SCP-451. It could have taken pity on him, maybe sympathizing with his plight and begrudgingly alleviating his solitude. Or it might have found Daryl to be a nuisance. We'll never know, and neither would SCP-451. As the years passed, SCP-173 continued to slow down and kept withering. Portions of its concrete body crumbled until they were little more than dust. The metal wired through the sculpture rusted, eventually coming to a stop. What was left of SCP-173 stopped moving, fixed to one spot where it would stay forever still. Not realizing it had perished, SCP-451 sat beside it and kept talking. The booming steps echoed through the museum corridors. Pharaohs, emperors, and Mongolian war leaders all stood stock still as the terrified security guard ran between them. Roger Pascal swung his flashlight this way and that. The light glinted on the polished steel of ancient weaponry, muskets, scimitars, and cannons. Exhibit after exhibit flashed past him as he ran through the dark museum. There was no way it was real. No possible way. He was having a bad dream. That's all it was. A bad dream. The shaking ground under his feet and the marching rhythm of the impossibly heavy footsteps behind him told him that it was real, all right. It had just been a normal shift like any other, just a regular night at the museum. Roger had been sipping his coffee and listening to the radio, when all of a sudden, he felt his chair start rumbling beneath him. He put his coffee down on the table and watched as it recoiled as the footsteps grew louder and closer. He got up to investigate and couldn't believe what he'd walked in on. Skidding around the corner, he tumbled into a medieval suit of armor and sent it crashing across the floor. Chainmail helmet, gauntlets, all of it rattled and crashed to the marble floor, echoing all through the museum. Then, there was a sudden deathly silence as the footsteps stopped. Roger didn't breathe. Then they started again, heading straight towards him. It was all Roger could do to lie on his back in front of the giant taxidermy eagle and point his flashlight at the door as the monstrous figure of the stone soldier walked around the corner, musket in hand. Woodstock, Vermont, 1995. It was a normal day just like any other. The birds were singing in the trees and there was a gentle breeze blowing through. Nothing at all out of the ordinary. Except, of course, the statue that opened its eyes. The Civil War Memorial had been a staple of Woodstock for well over 100 years. A plinth sitting in the middle of a park with a young soldier on top of it, holding a musket peacefully by his side. The statue had watched over the town generation after generation, except now its watching had become a little more active. It took several hours for anyone to notice. Dog walkers went past listening to their Walkmans. A banker sat on a bench opposite, deep in conversation on a giant brick phone. It was only when a young child running after her football looked up at the statue and saw it looking back at her that things changed. The girl's parents didn't listen to her, of course. Parents rarely do. But word quickly went around the girl's school. Most of the time, the statue was totally still, no movement in the eyes at all. But on occasion, when a group of kids gathered around it and talked to it enough, the statue seemed to look down at them as if it was listening. But that was it. No grown-ups were particularly interested in what the children were saying, and even a lot of the children who saw it went home concluding that they must have been imagining things. So six months went by without anyone really paying the statue much attention. That was until it fired its gun. In a quiet rural town, everyone hears a gunshot, but for a long time, no one could work out where it had come from. 
Police gathered around the park, searching all around where the weapon had been heard. The only clue they could find was a small hole in the wall of a shop across the street. A couple of officers joked that the shot must have come from the statue itself. Everyone laughed it off, except for a couple of the school kids who were playing nearby. Less than two weeks later, another shot rang out in the middle of the night, and a group of confused police officers rushed to the park to investigate what had happened. The only thing they found was a dead bird lying on the sidewalk, shot to death. Again, the jokes went around the department that it must have been the statue who did it. Except this time, the officers were all laughing a little less enthusiastically. Without much crime going on in Woodstock, Vermont, the department decided to take the shooting quite seriously, going so far as to perform an autopsy on the dead pigeon. But when they cut the animal open and looked at the wound inside its chest, they were filled with even more confusion than they were before. It wasn't a conventional bullet lodged into the bird's ribcage at all. It was perfectly round and made of what appeared to be stone. But the next shot that rang out from the Memorial Park was unmistakable. It was a weekend in the middle of the summer vacation, so the park was full of families all sitting around having picnics, barbecues, and staring up at the sky watching the birds circle lazily overhead. Bang! One of the pigeons exploded in a burst of feathers and plummeted out of the sky, landing on the sidewalk in front of the whole town. In shock, all of the townsfolk turned around to see the stone statue down on one knee with his musket on his shoulder. The statue looked down at all of them, surprised at the attention, then quickly got back to its feet and resumed its normal stance. Reports flooded all the local papers and news stations. The event was blamed on mass hysteria, a kind of group hallucination where everyone was somehow sharing the same story. But the number of people coming forward with the exact same account was irrefutable evidence. That's where the Foundation had to step in. In January 1996, containment procedures began and the statue was given the designation SCP-011. Of course, a large contingent of agents suddenly appearing in a small town would raise a lot of suspicion, so the Foundation had to move very cautiously. One agent at a time, the Foundation established itself in Woodstock and began to study the statue day in and day out. By sitting on park benches, even looking through cutout holes in newspapers, and wearing fake outfits so as not to arouse suspicion. Steadily over time, the statue appeared to gain either a heightened mobility or just a renewed sense of confidence. While much of the time it did remain standing immobile, it would begin to occasionally stretch when it thought no one was looking and glance this way and that in apparent annoyance with the bird circling over its head. The shooting steadily grew more regular. Foundation agents observed several birds being picked out of the sky by the musket fire of SCP-011 over the following weeks. A clear pattern started to emerge. The statue would only fire at birds that seemed to be flying above it or getting too curious about it. In fact, the more fecal matter built up on the statue, the more aggressive it would be. Both in its body language and mood seemed to sour the dirtier it got. While there were initial concerns about the SCP potentially turning its rifle towards the local townspeople, these worries were largely dismissed as SCP-011 gradually started to build up a rapport with those around it. Before long, the caretakers of the park were having exchanges with the SCP. These exchanges started with the caretakers speaking directly to the SCP and it nodding or subtly acknowledging the things they said. But over time, the interactions grew more and more personable. In the year 2000, SCP-011 spoke for the first time. It had just fired its rifle, picking off a pigeon from over 200 feet away, when a caretaker mildly exclaimed, Nice shot! The statue smiled, dipped his hat to the caretaker and said, Thank you, in a gravelly voice. This marked a significant change in the Foundation's approach to the containment of SCP-011. Up until this point, the SCP was considered a broadly harmless member of the local town community. However, its ability to speak raised concerns as to this SCP's development. Four years ago, it had been an immobile statue with nothing out of the ordinary to raise any suspicions among those around it. Where would its cognitive development end? Now that it had gained the ability to talk, groundskeepers and agents posing as groundskeepers struck up conversations with SCP-011 as often as possible. 
At first, these exchanges were brief, but over time, the SCP became steadily more vocal, until soon it was engaged in intellectual debates and sharing its views on the world with anyone who would listen. It was becoming clear that new containment measures were needed. In fact, SCP-011 soon lost interest in shooting birds. Or rather, the SCP was persuaded to stop shooting birds. While the prospect of having animals defecate on it still appeared to anger the statue, the Foundation was able to explain, through ideological grounds, why shooting birds was a disproportionate response relative to the minor harm they were doing to it. Keen to engage in philosophical and ethical discussions, the statue was very open to hearing the Foundation's viewpoint on the issue, and having sufficiently considered all sides of the debate, decided that it would, in fact, be better for the well-being of all involved if it stopped shooting the birds from the sky. In return, the caretakers and Foundation agents promised to do their best to clean it regularly and keep the animals at bay. But with word of this bizarre tourist attraction steadily gathering momentum as the age of email began to take off, the Foundation decided that it would be best to relocate SCP-011 entirely. However, agents who had been living in Woodstock for the prior four years were hesitant to relocate the entity to a test chamber or storage facility. The benefits that it had brought to the local community far outweighed the risks and threats that it posed. The statue had become a local celebrity, smiling and waving at children who went past, and even offering brief history lessons to any confused tourists who found themselves wandering through the park. Most just assumed it was a person in gray paint. It was Agent Khan who came up with the idea of relocating SCP-011 to a museum. Being kept indoors, away from the dangers of any fecal bombing runs, was the main priority. Khan argued that within a museum, the statue would blend in seamlessly with the exhibits around it. Furthermore, if anyone did see the statue move or talk, they would assume that it was an interactive exhibit and treated as such. Having shown a real love for academia, history, and debate, Khan believed that SCP-011 would benefit greatly from being in such a setting, both learning and eventually even teaching about the history of the American Civil War. However, when all these arguments were put forward to the statue itself, it was hesitant. Having spent the entirety of its cognitive existence standing on the same plinth, shooting at the same pigeons, the idea of relocating to somewhere new and unknown was very intimidating. Even with the soldier's mindset, SCP-011 was still feeling incredibly nervous about the idea of moving house. Agent Khan and SCP-011 found themselves locked in a stalemate. Try as she might, convincing the SCP to leave its current home was like talking to a brick wall, or rather, a stone wall. The pair of them ended up dropping the conversation for a couple years, focused instead on psychiatric evaluations and history lessons for the SCP. In 2002, the Foundation officially declared that SCP-011 had achieved sentience with a great enough level of self-awareness to pass as a normal human being, aside from the fact that it was composed entirely of stone. For two years, Agent Khan talked to SCP-011 every day on the park bench. The slats on the bench had to be replaced several times as the weight of the statue broke through them, snapping them clean in half on several occasions. During this period, the pair of them built up a rapport rarely seen between humans and SCPs. So much so that in 2004, Agent Khan managed to convince SCP-011 to move to a local museum on one condition. She would go as well. The Foundation agreed to the terms, deciding that Khan could take on the role of being a researcher in the museum. That way, she could keep an eye on SCP-011 and report any activities while the Foundation officially relinquished control over the SCP. What happened next was perhaps rather predictable, or at least it would be predictable to anyone who had worked with Agent Khan and SCP-011 during that time in Vermont. As the pair of them moved into their new lives at the museum, romantic feelings blossomed between them. Seeing as SCP-011 is officially outside of the SCP Foundation's jurisdiction, there has been no official inquiry into the nature and practicalities of the relationship between the woman and the statue. But from the reports that make their way to the Foundation every three months, it is clear that both are very much enjoying the privacy of their new arrangement. Roger Pascal closed his eyes, imagining the barrel raising higher and higher until it was pointed squarely at his face. He had been told by his bosses not to ask questions about the origins of the statue that had suddenly appeared in the Civil War section. 
Even when he saw the statue's eyes moving, he'd kept his mouth shut. That was until he was doing his security rounds that night and heard those booming footsteps leading him behind one of the displays. He had rushed over in a panic. Peering around the corner, he had been shocked to see Miss Khan, one of the researchers here, and the Civil War statue engaged in a passionate kiss. He had turned and bolted as fast as he could until he ended up here, terrified on the floor as he imagined the musket being leveled at him. But then a second pair of footsteps joined the group, and a woman's laugh filled the room. Opening his eyes, the security guard saw the pair of them, the statue and the researcher standing in the doorway, laughing about the whole situation. The musket was slung over the man's shoulder as he offered a cold, stony hand down to the security guard to help him up. Ironically, there was something about the statue's smile that softened Roger's stony heart as he was hauled to his feet. I have so many questions. Now check out SCP-173 Origin Story, How 173 Got to Site-19, and SCP-1913 Deadly Monster Squad, The Furies.